good evening to all of you and uh, let me welcome you all as the women cell and the department of english for the distinguished memorial college that is located in purulia west bengal india welcome you all to this a long a week long international level faculty development program on gender sensitivity now before moving to the session of the second day i am requesting all the participants listening on youtube live to remember three points this three points i have already mentioned yesterday also but for your benefit i am again mentioning this three points at the same time i am also mentioning the fact that i am overwhelmed to witness such a huge response on your side so kindly note that if you want to ask any question to any speaker during this faculty development program please send those questions to the whatsapp number that i have already mentioned in the flyer already mentioned in the telegram group kindly don't post the questions in the youtube chat box else i won't be able to pick those out so i'm requesting you all to send those questions to that particularly mentioned whatsapp number secondly all the assignments based on the topics of presentation will be given to the participants daily and they must have to submit the assignments within 12 hours it means you all have to submit that assignment within 9 am next to next till 10 am to next and after that i won't be able to entertain any of the individual request also e certificates will only be awarded to those participants who will submit assignments every day and complete all necessary formalities and at the same time i hope that you all have enjoyed yesterday's sessions and i am sure that today also we all will be enriched and also will get to know the picture of south asia and specially our neighboring countries that is pakistan and bangladesh and the uh, picture of uh, and so today we have with us three eminent speakers and they are dr krishna pannikot he is from nit karnataka india then we have with us professor nasmunina mehtab ji and she is from university of dhaka bangladesh and then we have with us dr rubaina zaka and she is from university of punjab pakistan so this three speakers from three different south eastern regions prove that we the academician don't believe in any kind of border narrative and partition among us and we are happy to collaborate academically for our collective betterment for giving more strength to our academic fraternity and for raising our voice whenever it's needed and i am thankful to them for proving me right that we are here for each other and education can broaden our mentality and thinking capacity and i believe that education is more than just learning how to read and write but it can also help us to grow personally professionally and socially it also help us become better versions of ourselves and it broadens our perspective to help us learn about different societies and cultures and today also we will get to the this kind of glimpses from this three speakers from three different regions now let us meet the first speaker with us on this second day we have with us dr krishna pannikot who is an associate professor in english in the school of management national institute of technology karnataka she is in the academic field since 2010 she is specialized in travel writing cultural studies gender studies and comparative literature she has done her ma mphil and phd from pondicherry central university and has won the gold medal for the best 
Memorial's PhD in 2010. He has won the Venus International Foundation Award of Young Women in Language Studies for the contribution and achievement in the field of English language in 2017. He has widely traveled to countries including Sri Lanka, Malaysia, Indonesia for giving talks in conferences and presenting papers. He has guiding six research scholars in the field of gender studies and cultural studies and he is a member of professional bodies including indian association for women studies asl india international economics development research center and indian association for commonwealth literature and language studies that i collect he has been a resource person in many national and international conferences in india and abroad and he has published a book on outcome based education towards a pedagogic shift in 2016 he has published in various national and international journals including scopus publications and today she is going to share her her observations and ideas on conceptualizing gender studies and critical awareness in literature now i'm um, requesting dr krishna pannikar ji to start yes yeah thank you dr gautam good evening everyone i am dr krishna pannikar and i will be engaging today a session on gender studies specifically in co collaboration with the critical awareness in literature so let's begin the session so gender studies is an area which has close connections with literature it is allied with literature and as literary enthusiasts we had been working over years in this particular field so let's examine this field in detail and try to understand the concepts and the ideologies and the uh, the traits and the qualities that are being taken into consideration in the field of gender studies and also examine certain areas in which gender studies has to really work in in the context of literature so gender studies is an interdisciplinary academic field which is devoted to analyzing gender identity and gendered representation so these are two key terms gender identity and gender representations which have clear connection with the field of gender studies uh, so uh, the allied areas which come under this large term of gender studies include women studies men studies and lgbt plus that's a queer studies so women studies uh, if you focus on women studies it focuses on women uh, the feminisms and also gender and politics in the area similarly in the context of men studies it focuses on the construction of masculinity the men's body which is also a site of a uh, lot of research and also on the politics involved with masculinities and in the context of queer study the identity sexuality and rights are also taken into consideration so it's a large umbrella term and uh, as far as literature people we are just touching only the tip of the iceberg and there is a vast ice which is lying hidden which we have to explore in this area of gender studies and literature moving on uh, we are going to talk about gender studies and its association with other domains or other areas of knowledge so gender studies is clearly associated with sexuality studies sex and sexuality has larger connotation in the field of gender studies and it also has its extended uh, connections with literature history political science sociology cinema anthropology law public health and also medicine so these are all areas in which gender studies has a role to play Uh, in the context of knowledge it is also connected with race ethnicity location class and nationality and it intersects with gender and sexuality also so this is the domain where power plays an important role because gender has relations with race ethnicity location class and nationality as uh, the french writer and feminist simon de beauvoir has rightly said one is not born but rather becomes a woman this particular statement is not just applicable to uh, women studies or feminism per se it has its own connotations in other areas also in other gender identities also so we can apply this becoming the the context of becoming one in the context of masculinity studies 
also in the context of queer studies so this is a term which has a lot of the term becoming has a lot of repercussions a lot of uh, significance in the field in all the domains of gender studies uh, if we take for example uh, the masculinity studies stalwart rw connell for example she has she's an australian sociologist and she has given immense contribution to the field of masculinity studies so if we refer to connell's ideas on masculinity we can see that gender refers to the social and cultural construction of masculinity and femininity and not to the state of being male and female in its entirety so here also if you see this uh, the observation by this sociologist you can see that there is no entirety there is it's not completely clustered because it's an area which is worth exploring further so we can see that gender studies has larger scope in the context of literary studies also because a larger area is yet remaining to be explored moving on uh, we can see the uh, relevance of gender studies uh, we can see that gender is pertinent to many disciplines i have already listed some of the areas in the earlier slides it is connected with literary theory as uh, uh, people as uh, uh, people who work on literature per se we have lot to do with literary theory and we had been using lot of theories uh, in the context of understanding gender and literature so it has larger connection with literary theory it is also connected with theater and drama studies also so gender studies has a great role to play with drama studies and it has also its connection with film theory because you can see lot of uh, films are also researched upon and we are trying to understand gendered identities through understanding of films and movies so we can see that it is closely connected with film theories also and it has also its relevance in contemporary art theories also and similarly it has to do with anthropology sociology cultural studies and psychology coming to uh, us we majorly focus on literary theory theater film theory and even we work on cultural studies but and psychology but anthropology and sociology as far as the large domain of literature is concerned anthropology and sociology and its connection with literature and gender studies is area is an area which is yet to be explored so these there is a scope for understanding gender studies and literature in the context of all these disciplines and there is lot of work yet to be done in this fields moving on we are focusing on the construction of gender so we can say that women's liberation movement has a major role in the development of gender studies as an area so we can see that it was more sympathetic towards feminism a lot of theories have come out a lot of theoreticians have worked on these areas so women's liberation movement was more aligned towards feminism to a larger extent in comparison to that of other allied areas of gender studies so this is one major gap that we can identify also in the field of gender studies we can see that many of the roles especially the sex roles are internalized that is one major area where gender studies need to rework on in the present we can see that it's a product of social learning or socialization so due to this process of socialization and uh, social learning we have tried to internalize certain sex roles and these roles have tried to create an identity and we work closely compartmentalizing or segmenting these identities so internalization is one of the major process which has happened over the years in the context of gender studies also and also sexuality so sex roles have been internalized and it has a larger impact on the kind of research also that is happening in this field and roles uh, we have to examine roles in details now because roles are based on expectations or norms in social life so coming to gender studies and literature also we can see that literature also depicts uh, the reality the social reality so we can see that it has uh, more to do with uh, the real life the society and the culture so roles are also certain uh, based on certain expectations that every culture has 
uh, on the social life. So now these roles need to be made more complementary. That is one area where gender studies has to work on in the present because uh, there is a lot of binaries which work and there is a lot of segregation that has happened based on which we are trying to segment studies and we are trying to limit gender studies only to specific domains. So these roles need to be made more complementary so that we can have more uh, elaborate studies in this area. Uh, roles in social situation, if we take the metaphor of dramaturgy, we can see that uh, there, there is a well-defined script to perform. So there is a performance involved as far as roles are concerned. In real life scenario, in a social setup also, we can see that mostly any gender identity that we have, we try to perform it. We are here using the metaphor of drama, but in real life also this performance happens, whether it's a masculine or a feminine or any kind of roles that we take up, this is all performative in nature. And we can also see that there is a clear audience to perform. And this clear audience in the context of real life is the society. So our performance is uh, understood and analyzed by the society and we are also given an identity. The identity is constructed by the society based on the performance that we give. So as, as seen in dramaturgy and also in real life, there is an element of performance and there is an element of judgment which is happening. And literature also has these elements of performance. If you see literary characters also, they are set in a different cultural context. And there is an element of performance which is happening in that given context of a text. So everywhere you can see that there is this element of performativity which is underlying in any gender identity. And we can see that the stakes are too high. The risk elements are too high. If we perform in a different manner, based on that, the assessment and the judgment also varies. So these roles are highly performative in nature and uh, we can also relate it with the theories of Judith Butler also in this context. So construction of gender is through these roles that we perform in the day to day life. Moving on uh, in modern European and American culture, if you see, uh, for example, masculinity, it does not exist except in contrast with femininity. If you, see, if you check the critical studies which are done in the context of gender studies, we can see that masculinity and femininity are seen as binaries. So definitely there is an element of comparison which happens across cultures also. And gender identities uh, are mostly rooted in a specific culture and it is given a kind of uh, performative nature based on the culture in which it is rooted. So we can see that here there is uh, in the European and American culture, we can say that there is an element of, uh, you know, correlation between binaries and the studies focus mostly based on these binaries. The term masculine and feminine are uh, at this point uh, a matter of uh, understanding and concern. So it points on the categorical sex differences. So categorization, as I have already told, it's all happening in gender studies and this categorical differences of sex has given or has framed these identities. And gender is a way in which social practices are also ordered. In day-to-day -day life, the practices that we see, even uh, in, in, in literature also for that matter, all these things are arranged based on the gender which is being performed. And everyday conduct of life is also organized in relation to reproductive arena. So we have, uh, when we associate gender identity in a particular culture, we try to see the reproductive arena also, which is uh, constantly related with these gender identities. So we can see that there is uh, two constructions which are clearly visible. One is a normative and the other one is deviant. These are the two constructs. So anything which is uh, socially applicable or which according to the society is uh, acceptable is considered to be normative and any other behavior, any other role taking which is against uh, the society or which is against the social norms, the per se norms, that is considered to be deviant in nature. So this is where the queerness or the difference happens in gender identity and the gender construction. So these are this is how gender is constructed in day to day real life. Now we are moving ahead with the contributions that uh, gender studies has from other domains, other areas of knowledge. 
which includes that of uh, medicine that of criminology and sociology also and also it has relations with cultural studies and anthropology so these are all allied areas in which gender studies has been working on and literature uh, in literature also we need to have some kind of connection between interdisciplinary studies so that we can understand gender studies in more detail so uh, we can see uh, Mary Douglas, Peter Berger, Robert Wuthno, Jürgen Habermas, and Michel Foucault. All these are the contributors who have contributed to anthropology, sociology, and cultural studies in the context of understanding gender. Uh, here uh, it is very relevant to talk about uh, Foucault's power knowledge which really has an important uh, uh, contribution towards understanding of gender. So we can see that uh, uh, there is a social control which is formed. There is a new set of uh, social control which is uh, which is evidently seen from Foucault's narratives where he talks about uh, clinics and prison, factories and psychotherapy which is also seen as a mode of controlling of the society. So power knowledge is another factor which has given uh, the identity for different genders. And gender is done or accomplished in everyday practices that creates a common sense knowledge and meaning of society as could be evidently seen from ethno methodology. So ethno methodology is also another domain in which gender studies has a larger role to play which is also closely connected. And these practices enables the construction of the gendered knowledge. So the knowledge that we have about gender and sexuality and sex per se, it is all based on these practices, this performance and this role taking which is clearly seen in the present. But uh, there are certain gaps as far as literature is concerned. There are certain areas which are not addressed or redressed thoroughly in the present. So we have to understand these areas and we have to work more in these areas. Moving on, uh, we talk about literary research. Literary research uh, has many domains in which we function. One is literary theory. We closely uh, connect and talk uh, about any text based on theories. So theories is uh, literary theories and criticism is one area uh, which we generally as literature savvy people, we generally use literary theories and we try to apply theories uh, on uh, narratives and try to identify or understand meanings out of it. So theory and criticism, applied criticism is uh, one area in which literary research mostly happen around uh, 50 percentage of the literary research is mostly focusing on literary theory and its application and application of literary theory in the context of gender studies also can be vividly seen uh, another area is textual analysis so we can see that uh, literary research mostly focuses on textual analysis so here also majority of the research that happens uh, in the present and even the, the research that had happened purely relied on literary uh, analysis of text. So uh, there is a close analysis of content which happens when we go for studying uh, literary narratives. So we can see that it is applicable in all genres. We can see it applied in poetry. We can see its application in prose. We can see uh, its application in uh, novels, uh, short stories, and autobiography, and so many other areas which are clearly connected to literature. So textual analysis uh, or a close analysis of the content is something that is clearly visible in literary research. So we analyze characters, we analyze themes, we an analyze plots, we analyze settings, and we also analyze language. So characters in the context of gender studies also we can see that mostly uh, 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 most of the research pertaining to literary research, pertaining to textual analysis has happened focusing on character analysis. So the characters which uh, portray kind of uh, oppression uh, is projected and we are trying to relate and connect this oppression to any of the theories or any of the ideologies that we are familiar with. So character analysis is one of the crux areas in which literature and literary theory works on and we also analyze themes and concerns of a work and uh, also the plot in which uh, this work is set and the settings and the language which is used in the work so that we understand uh, the text in a far better manner so all these elements are juxtaposed uh, with understanding of gender and uh, gender gendered identity so this is how literary research mostly focus on in the context of textual analysis 
next is uh, discourse analysis so uh, language in its raw form we try to study language in its raw form through discourse analysis this is another area in which literary research uh, purely functions on and then we have ethnography work uh, we go with the interpretation of cultural behavior through data collection so ethnography is a field uh, as far as literary research is concerned we mostly rely on text and uh, narratives and lesser of ethnographical studies uh, are seen even in the present so there is enough scope for understanding ethnography in the context of understanding gender studies and sexuality and sex also so there is a lot of uh, lot of scope for this particular area ethnography uh, the cultural behavior through data collection in varied forms we can do that and uh, another area is autobiography so autobiographical texts are also one uh, important domain in which literary research happens so autobiographical text materials episodes or stories are being studied and understood and critiqued in the present but then one major lacuna in this area is that we have very less number of autobiographies we have dire need for more uh, works in this area in this domain because uh, most of the works are um, uh, fictional in nature and autobiographical elements and autobiographies per se the episode stories and uh, the narratives which have auto autobiographical undertones these are comparatively less uh, worked on less produced as well as worked on in the context of gender studies and literature so there is enough scope for more work in this domain plus more research also in autobiographies next is oral history uh, coming to literature again oral history is of another area which needs more of exploration collection of information from people in the form of varied interviews uh, happens in oral history so literary literature oral there is a lot of scope for understanding oral literatures and oral history also and uh, its application its uh, relevance in the field of gender studies also has to be worked on so mostly there is scope for understanding literature from the perspective of ethnography uh, from the angle of autobiography and also from oral history in the context of gender studies uh, textual analysis is something which a lot of work has happened in the present and there is enough scope for studying more text and more works also uh, which we acknowledge but other than that there are there is a lot of uh, gap which is seen in literature in the context of these domains which i have already listed now uh, we are uh, going to understand uh, the objectives for gender studies and research in literature uh, what are the areas what are what what are the major concerns that we have in this domain so uh, our understanding of gender and sex that is one major uh, area in which uh, we have to really work on because as i have already told you there is a lot of segmenting there is a lot of compartmentalization which has happened in these domains uh, we try to uh, differentiate gender and sex and try to see it from uh, uh, two different perspectives say uh, sex uh, we see it only from the biological perspective and uh, gender from the social construct and most of the literary research happens in the domain of understanding gender especially from the cultural and social construct and not from the biological perspective of sex so there is a lot of scope for understanding sex and sexuality in literature which is a gray area as far as current literary research is conducted and uh, there are few queries which come in this uh, context also is the perception of sex a problem in gender politics so uh, perceptions of sex uh, the ideas that we have about sex and sex roles is this is this having a larger role to play in the gender politics that is number one question that we have to uh, ask and redress through the research which has to happen in the present and is it institutional arrangements that produce inequality in gender identity so is it something like the institutional arrangements we are trying to institutionalize gender and sex and is this arrangement that produce inequality in gender identity so we have to uh, we have to touch on these gray areas which are slightly disturbing areas also and we have to try to bring in uh, some kind of relational connection between gender and sex rather than seeing it as two different entities altogether moving on uh, we will have some discussion on women's studies masculinity studies and also on queer studies in the upcoming segments uh, starting off with women's studies uh, 
Uh, Sam Killerman's concept of gender is something which is worth examining in this uh, in this context. Uh, Sam Killerman talks about uh, gendered categories, which is very relevant in the present, in the way in which we perceive gender. Uh, we perceive gender based on three different categories. These categories are gender identity, gender expression, and biological sex. If you go to literature, literary research basically focuses on the first two areas. One is gender identity and the other one, which is gender expression. The third area, which is the biological sex, is something where a lot of research has to happen, even in the present. Even though research is happening, there is more scope for understanding biological sex in the context of literature. So we try to talk about gendered identity through works, uh, how identity is created, how a particular person is considered to be masculine or feminine, how, how oppression happened, how patriarchy functions. All these things are studied through literature. We also talk about expressions, the linguistic expressions also, and also the myriad ways in which the characters try to express their gender identity through research in literature and gender studies. But the biological sex, the, the body also speaks. And this particular area, the, uh, the, uh, the roles uh, which, uh, the, the sex roles that we have as individuals in society and the body has to be dissected and has to be studied in the current uh, understanding of literature and gender studies. So this biological sex is one category, one gendered area which has to be further studied and examined in the context of research in gender studies and literature. Now, uh, coming to women's studies, again, this uh, devoted to topics concerning to women, gender, feminism, and politics. So these are some domains in which women's studies mostly work on. It focuses on women. It focuses on different uh, uh, gender issues that uh, women have. And it also focuses on the different feminisms, the liberal feminism, radical feminism, black feminism, and so many other feminisms, uh, environmental feminism, everything is being discussed through women's studies and also the politics involved. So these are major concerns of women's studies. And mostly we focus on suffrage movements and also an, on social history. And uh, most of us have worked a lot in these areas uh, on social history, understanding the history and uh, women's suffrage. And we have also worked on women's fiction. There are a lot of works which have come up over the years, over the centuries. We have come up with a lot of works which have a lot to do with women's rights and women's movements. So women's fiction is also something which has been overly studied and explored, but it doesn't uh, limit the purview of understanding women's studies because there is a lot more to talk about, a lot more to discuss also in the context of women and fiction also. Uh, but then coming to the uh, domain of women's health, medicine and literature, this is one area where lesser studies have happened. So there is more scope for understanding medicine and literature, uh, understanding the female body from the perspective, from the medical perspective. That is something where literature can have interdisciplinary studies. So connecting medicine and literature with gender studies. Similarly, women and psychology, if you see uh, women and psychology, uh, we generally try to use uh, overly used theories and theoreticians like uh, uh, Sigmund Freud, Lacan and Jung. These are the proponents, these are the theoreticians which, uh, over which most of our theories have been worked on. But now I am trying to tell you that there is much scope for understanding women's psychology. Uh, for from DSM-5. So I'm not really sure how many uh, literature enthusiasts will be working on DSM-5 also. DSM-5, for those who don't know DSM-5, is a Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. This is a fifth edition of that, which is uh, by APA. So DSM-5 is one uh, important uh, work uh, which can be uh, taken into consideration when we study women and psychology because uh, when we see, uh, for example, if we take a character in a particular novel for that matter, say for example, Doris Lessing's character Anna in uh, The Golden Notebook, if you take this character for, for that matter, you can see that uh, there is a particular instance where uh, this character is trying to fix, uh, cut newspaper cuttings and trying to fix it uh, on the walls. And the whole walls, once it is filled, it, it is removed and again, again she does the same process of cutting and fixing it up. 
so if you see this particular this particular character and this particular problem at hand we can see that if we if we ex examine dsm 5 we can see that there is something called obsessive compulsive disorder which is a medical term which is a psychological term which has larger uh, meanings involved so if you see that we can see that there is scope for understanding psychology from a larger per perspective of the disorder which is obsessive compulsive disorder so trying to connect literature with medicine with psychology has larger uh, impact in the present so we should try to relate most of our studies to other interdisciplinary domains so that we can explore these gender identities in a more clearer manner so there is more scope for understanding uh, characters and works based on the contemporary psychological studies and health uh whatever literatures are available the journals and reviews are available uh, the medicine and literature also has larger scope for studies in the present so we we generally work on prominent uh, women uh, the feminist writers including virginia wolf mary wollstone craft simon de beauvoir firestone petty frieden jane austen bronte sisters emily dickinson sylvia plath morrison margaret atwood lahri doris lessing adiche mahashwada devi arundhati roy chitra banerjee divagarani anita desai shashi desh pande to list a few of the writers and the critics who have worked in this area it's a vast ocean so feminism and women studies have have established itself and um, we have also have we also have lot of works which have come up in these areas uh, but what is the challenge that we face what are the challenges in literature that we face in the present the major challenge is universalizing the women suffering so we are trying to universalize women suffering say if you take any work a work uh, by virginia wolf or you take a work by jumpa lahani we are trying to universalize the suffering we are trying to connect everything and conclude or uh, put it in our finding saying that there is a suffering involved or there is a problem involved uh, definitely there is a problem involved we don't uh, we don't say that we don't we are not trying to say that there is no problem involved but then we are trying to universalize the women suffering and this is one area where we have to really rethink over because the these problems that women have Uh, in the context of women studies cannot be universalized there is scope for understanding it from different perspective we will examine that a little later and there is a need for more expressiveness of female body and sexuality so female body uh, coming to different cultures there is taboo still involved in understanding or even in decoding uh, the uh, the female body which is being mentioned or which is being depicted through literature so there is there is a need for more expressiveness there is a need for expressing the body and there is a need for expressing sexuality also which which i feel uh, is limited in the context of literary depictions as well as in the context of literary research so this is one major challenge that we have even in the in the works that we take for our research also if we go with textual analysis we can see that expressiveness of the body or expressiveness of sexuality is limited because of varied reasons there are so many reasons there is politics involved in that uh, the, the there is a uh, problems related to the crisis the identity crisis also there are so many elements which are, which are refrain ourselves from expressing the body and the sexuality so there is need for this is one major challenge that we face as literature uh, the, as researchers in the field of literature uh, this is limited so this is one more area where we have to focus on and there is a need for more interdisciplinary studies uh, as i have already emphasized and as i am reemphasizing interdisciplinary studies has lot of scope in literature which is not for this is still not explored in the present so there is more scope for understanding literature uh, in context of gender studies as well as in the context of interdisciplinary studies and uh, we can also see that there is a juxtaposition of traits and qualities associated with other sex this is another major challenge that we have in the context of understanding gender studies and literature moving on uh, we are moving to the next segment which is masculinity study uh, we are trying to see masculinity studies from the perspective of uh, uh, the quotes by margaret atwood Uh, i don't think enough attention has been paid to the problem men have 
and are going to have increasingly because of the changes taking place in women. Men have to be re-educated with the minimum of damage to them. These are our husbands, our sons, our lovers. We can't live without them and we can't go to war against them. The change must liberate them as well. So what I'm trying to emphasize here is that there is a need for re-emphasizing on the need for understanding masculinity studies whereby understanding masculinity studies is a step towards liberation of men as well as liberation of other identities, other gendered identities. So there is a lot of scope for understanding masculinity studies. If we see most of the uh, most of the recent studies which has happened on the victimization of genders, we can see that the recent studies have focused on victimization of men in a larger context than that of other genders. So some of the national surveys, some of the national studies which are conducted on gender victimization clearly showcases that men are also victimized uh, by different kind of gender violence. So there is enough scope for understanding masculinity studies and pursuing masculinity studies as an area of research in literature, which uh, I feel has been uh, put on the uh, purview on the sites, on the margins, uh, because of the uh, establishment of other gendered identities and other gender rights. So masculinity studies is one more area where uh, there is a lot of scope for understanding and uh, research. Let's examine masculinity studies in detail. Masculinity studies focuses on men's studies. It focuses on the topics concerning men, gender and politics. So uh, uh, men are the center in the context of masculinity studies uh, and the politics involved in the construction of masculinity is also something which is being studied in the purview of masculinity studies and masculinity studies is, cannot be considered as a domain which does not have any connection with other streams never because masculinity studies has also is also aligned and connected with other areas in the field of gender studies it has clear connections with women's studies it has clear connections with queer studies so there are connections uh, there are intertwined connections which uh, could be seen in the context of masculinity studies and there is a politics involved in masculinity studies as well so feminist theory we cannot forego feminist theories when we talk about masculinity and also other gender theories in the context of understanding masculinity because as i have already told you there is always a binary which is existing so uh, we can uh, we can say self and the other the terms which sociologists and anthropologists use so we can study the other only in relation with the self so there is a clear connection between masculinity studies and feminist studies and the studies on queer and other sexual identities so all these areas all these domains are closely connected this has also connections with men's history uh, there is a evolution there is history there is a social construction which has happened over years uh, which has been carried forward even in the present so the history retracing men's history uh, retracing the men's identity and the construction of identity which has uh, connections in history has to be explored in the present so men's history is another area which ha which has a lot of uh, relevance in the understanding of literature even social history also connecting uh, men and society and the construction how masculinity how the construction of masculinity has happened over the years over the centuries that also has a lot of connection a lot of relevance in masculinity studies similarly is the case with men's fiction we have a lot of works uh, written by male authors uh, which have uh, uh, central male characters as well as central female characters but then uh, men's fiction also has to be seen from the perspective of understanding masculinity so there is a scope for studying uh, re re-reading of uh, fiction re-reading of non-fiction uh, from the perspective of understanding literature and masculinity studies Similarly, uh, men's health. This is another area in which a uh, lot of uh, scope is there for understanding studies uh, on literature and uh, masculinity. So 
men's health uh, is worth uh, research uh, worth understanding and uh, how the construction of the male body the construction of male body uh, the social construction of the male body uh, functions this is also one area in which uh, we have uh, much scope for exploration in the present so men's health and the construction of uh, male body is one area in which masculinity study largely relies on uh, where there is lot of scope for studying in the context of literature also and men's psychology men's thoughts and behaviors so we have been uh, very rigid in our understanding of masculinity uh, and uh, we have been rigid in the understanding of men's uh, sexual identity men sexuality so we have to be we have to be more fluid we have to be more flexible in uh, our own understanding of uh, uh, the men's thoughts and also on the men's behavior also so uh, behavior understanding behaviors understanding the beliefs understanding how the men's brain or the men's uh, thoughts function is also another area which is worth examining in the context of literature and gender studies Uh, so we have lot of uh, prominent uh, male writers established writers starting off with aristotle byron mark twain fleming thomas mallory roswell christopher marlowe william shakespeare cervantes hemingway faulkner conrad joyce shyam selva the right to the reason the mohsin hamid kushwan singh mahesh dattani and khalid, uh, khalid husseini so we have lot of uh, uh, writers across continents who have worked uh, who have brought out lot of literature which we have already explored but then as i have already told there is a scope for understanding all these works reworking and uh, uh, re uh, researching these areas of masculinities in the context of literature so there is immense scope for understanding uh, literature from uh, all these literatures reworking on all these literatures in the context of masculinity studies masculinities if you focus on masculinities it has uh, uh, shaped into the form of a particular area or a research domain and it has uh, been constructed over years it has been uh, constructed over centuries but then it has established itself into an area of research in the recent so in the 1980s and 90s if you see construction of masculinity masculinities was based on specific settings based on specific cultures uh best based on uh, specific ethnography so masculinities have evolved into an area uh, based on certain cultural and uh, social context you can uh, see that uh, if you observe the historical accounts you can also see that there is a change of masculinities masculinity is not a a fixed identity masculinity cannot be considered as a fixed identity it, it can be considered as an identity which has been as i have already told you which has evolved over the years evolved over the centuries and uh, definitely historical accounts also connect us in the understanding of this changes that has happened in masculinities so like feminisms that we study masculinities also has uh, evolved over the years and it has uh, it is becoming a firmer domain for study in the present and uh, there is a move beyond abstract sex role framework also earlier we were we had very abstract uh, sex roles we had very rigid frameworks on which roles gendered roles were structured so now uh, in the present we can see that there is a move beyond these abstract roles and we we are going out of these frameworks we do, we know no more stick into this framework of understanding gender identity and we have to see it from a more a uh, larger framework and we have to go beyond these abstractions we can see that this change has happened over the years and there is change in masculinities in us australia britain japan new zealand south africa latin america france germany middle east brazil so uh, over the continents over countries there is change which has happened and all this change is specific to the culture we can try to relate, relate the change that has happened in a different uh, continent to maybe india for that matter to asia for that matter but then these are all different variations these are all shades of masculinities 
and uh, uh, moving on to the construction of masculinity we can see that uh, cultural social and anthropological construction of gender has had a significant role in applied re research in the construction of masculinity so masculinity studies also cannot forego and stand by itself without its connections with cultural studies or with sociology or with anthropology or with allied disciplines or other areas of uh, uh, knowledge and research construction of masculinities over the years uh, has been contributed through areas like imperialism has contributed nationalism has contributed national identities have also contributed to the construction of masculinity so it's a large domain which as i have already told you if you sketch the history of masculinities also it has larger scope for understanding in the purview of literature because we talk about imperialism we talk about nationalism we talk about national identities but we don't connect this with the development of masculinity with the development of the male over the years so this is one area where there is a lot of scope for understanding uh, construction of masculinity and uh, uh, we we can also uh, bring in uh, hegemonic masculinity in this uh, context antonio gramsci also has spoken about uh, masculinity the hegemonic uh, hegemonic uh, construction of uh, masculinity which focuses on the problems of legitimacy of patriarchy the dominant position of men and the subordination of women so masculinity has uh, been contributed through these kind of uh, theories and constructions of ideologies uh, which focuses on power through legitimacy of patriarchy and the position that men have the subordination of other gender identities also have played a major role in our understanding of masculinity and also we try to relate it with education health violence and also to certain roles like that of fathering which is considered to be a uh, gender role so construction of masculinity also has its connection with latin american machismo and uh, which focuses on the stressing of domination of men over women and the competition that men have between men and also the aggressive display of power uh, to showcase the masculine role and also the predatory sexuality and the double standards so these have constructed the idea that we have about masculinity so these are all constructs this is this uh, this is not the the reality these are all constructed roles which has been constructed and carried forward over the years in order to shape the identity of the masculine so there is a need for organized knowledge in clinical practice and academic research this is the need of the hour we need to have an organized knowledge which has connection with other domains as i have already emphasized in the form, in the context of academic research so literary research when we do literary research we have to connect literature with these organized knowledge so that our research is more rooted in understanding the core the masculine and the male roles and uh, similarly it has also contributed to gay liberation and homophobia in countries uh, like for example us also uh, it has given space for further movements in the in the same in the allied areas so uh, this is about the construct of masculinity and uh, <clears throat> there are certain gender identities which has been framed uh, through masculinity the gender identity of being a real man or a natural man or deep masculinity for that matter these are all constructs uh, gendered identities which has been constructed based on the performance of certain roles over the years and uh, we also have uh, the, uh, uh, the the idea of the aggression advantage which which showcases men even when we see literature or literary depictions we can see that uh, aggression advantage is widely used in literature we can see that uh, the presentation the depiction of men or the male characters in certain narratives for that matter are presenting men as aggressive than other genders it's not just uh, women it it is uh, uh, across other gender identities also trying to project men as being aggressive than that of other gender identities so aggression advantage was also something which has been used in the context of the construction of masculinity and uh, we can see the meta metaphor of body as machine in this context uh, where body functions and operates it functions in a particular manner and it operates in order to 
uh, in order to showcase certain signs or certain uh, symbols or representations which showcases its identity and also certain biological mechanisms in behavior certain kinds of behaviors which we can consider as more masculine or male and uh, certain ways of uh, hardwiring say for example a machine similarly the brain is also hardwired to produce masculinity so uh, the way of thinking our thought process is also hardwired in such a way that we try to project a particular identity in a particular manner by associating all the attributes that they perform in a particular manner as equal to that gender identity so brains are also hardwired in order to produce this gender identity and uh, again in the with the metaphor with the metaphor of the body as a machine we can see that men are uh, genetically programmed for aggression so this is another uh, aggressive behavior which is programmed uh, in the form of a machine uh, in the in the metaphor of a machine we can see that this is also another genetically programmed behavior which we try to attribute to masculinity and also the dominance in our biogram also the overall biogram also we can see that this metaphor of body as machine function so masculinity as i have already told it's it, it cannot be just considered as a theoretical concept or an idea which but it has a more in depth core meanings associated and it is worth understanding and studying and uh, there are many terminologies that we associate uh, with the masculinity uh, for example male which focuses on the psychological sex that produces sperm this is one way of seeing male the other way is gay gay as a homosexual person or masculinity which includes manhood or manliness which can be seen as a set of behaviors and roles associated with men which can be as i have already connected it uh, which has performative undertones and but uh, a woman having qualities traditionally seen as masculine and also impotent which means incapable of sexual intercourse or an effeminate which means having feminine qualities which are untypical of men so uh, here we can see effeminate in the use of this particular idea this concept we can see that feminine qualities which are untypical of men so men are supposed to behave or men are supposed to project certain roles which are considered to be typical of the male identity and anything that goes against this behavior anything which cannot be considered as a normative behavior anything which can be considered as a, a behavior which is against the norms or a de or a deviant behavior for that matter is considered to be untypical of men so this is how we are wired we are hardwired in this manner so that every work that we see we see it uh, every literature that we perceive we perceive these literatures we do research we understand these works uh, mostly focusing on these uh, this behavior so this is these are the terminologies which have lot of meanings in the context of masculinity <clears throat> so now let's examine the new concerns in masculinity what are our concerns so we need to focus on knowledge which is beyond science and common for we need to deconstruct we need to uh, we need to re rework on masculinities also in the context of our understanding of literature and gender studies so this is one area which has which has to go beyond the general knowledge that we have the general science that we have the general common sense that we use beyond that we have to work on in our understanding of gender studies and masculinities in the context of literature there is an intuitive knowledge of deep masculine also which uh, which which is a major concern in the present uh <clears throat> research on sex differences in bodies is one area which comes under this deep masculine and also the behavior brain sex and the hormonal differences the genetic codings which are connected with social practices these are all areas which are gray areas in the context of our understanding of literature and masculinity so we have immense immense scope by now i have given you lot of areas in which uh, there is lot of scope for doing research in literature in the context of gender studies and masculinity per se so these are new concerns in masculinity studies which are being worked it's not that there is no work happening there are a lot of works which are coming in these areas but these are some areas in which we as uh, literature savvy people we have to work on in these areas 
let's now examine some more concerns in masculinity studies. Uh, men are not uh, permanently committed to a particular pattern of masculinity. So this is our concern. We, we have to focus on masculinity from the uh, point of masculinities. So there, there is no permanence. There is always deviance. So men are not permanently committed to a particular pattern of masculinity. So never expect men and the masculinities to be in a particular order. So there is no order. There is uh, there is more scope for understanding beyond the ordered method of understanding the male and the masculinity. They make situationally specific chores from a cultural repertoire of ma masculine behavior. So the, the new concerns are on the masculine behavior, which is again culture centric. There are a lot of uh, specific uh, chores which are associated with a specific culture, which generates these kind of masculine identities and there is a scope for understanding binary research which uh, which should be disrupted in the context of masculinity we should not uh, go just with the binaries uh, we should we should not just see masculinity from the perspective of homosexual or uh, uh, or heterosexual or based on our understanding of man woman or the other but we should we should disrupt this understanding we should we should forego this understanding and we should try to understand masculinity per se as a domain of knowledge and study masculinities the other uh, shades of masculinities which can be seen in the context of understanding masculinity studies now we move on uh, to the contemporary gender concern Masculine and feminine are among the most confused that occur in science according to Freud. So Sigmund Freud, I'm quoting again in this context. So these are the most confused areas in science according to Sigmund Freud. And these are the most confused areas even in the present because there is more scope for understanding these areas. It is not limited. The scope is vast. And there is a need to re-examine guilt, fear, shame, sorrow, all these elements that were not aligned as gender traits of men in the perspective of literature. Uh, coming to un uh, our understanding generally from the perspective of women's studies or feminism or from other uh, other domains or other gender identities, we generally associate other identities with these elements, the element of guilt, the element of fear, the element of shame, the element of sorrow. This is all assigned to other gender identities. But we somehow try not to associate these identities to these uh, these elements to masculinity so these are also elements which we can examine the element of masculinity and the the uh, guilt or fear and masculinity shame and masculinity or sorrow or oppression in the context of masculinity so these are all elements or these are all traits of men which we need to explore further in the context of literature and gender studies Next is victimization also. Victimization is not attributed to men, hence less studies uh, uh, are there in the context of masculinity and victimization. We see it from sociological and anthropological perspective. Victimization is studied in ethnography. Victimization is, is studied in history. Victimization is studied in sociology. Victimization is studied in all other disciplines. But victimization of men in literature is one area which we need to examine further. Oppression in men's personal sexism also is yet another area which needs to be explored in the field of literature. Uh, now we are moving on to the last segment, uh, the other gender identity construct. Uh, I begin with Robert Stoller, uh, who's, uh, who, who has been one of the stalwarts in the invention of the transsexual. And uh, there are two areas uh, in which uh, uh, the transsexual uh, identities are also constructed. One is the creation of surgical techniques for gender reassignment. So, uh, early in the earliest uh, times also, gender reassignment surgeries uh, were conducted. And uh, uh, nowadays, it is prominently seen. Uh, many many, uh, many uh, individuals undergo sex uh, reassignment surgeries so that uh, gendered identities are created, new identities are created. So sex reassignment surgeries, surgical techniques are used in the present in order to take up new identities. So uh, it is against the classical Freudian view of gender as contradictory structure. So now we have gone beyond genders, beyond identities. So uh, we need to examine these constructs also. 
and uh, we have, we can see that there is an emergence of queer studies sexual diversity studies and lgbt plus studies also uh, which is a uh, which is an uh, which is uh, which is an area which has established itself it's, uh, it's it cannot be considered as emerging because uh, we have lot of uh, works lot of contributions in this field so uh, this studies the queer studies or the sexual diversity studies or lgbt studies have also established itself and there is a new gender identity which is being constructed in the present which is also debated and discussed in the context of literature so studies uh, it studies issues related to sexual orientation and gender identity focusing on lesbians gays bisexual transgender gender dysphoria and also asexual queer questioning intersex people uh, i'm not uh, i'm not uh, trying to say that uh, it is limited to these areas there are so many domains under which uh, queer studies function there is sexual diversity so there are so many sex identities the gendered identities which are being constructed and these are some of the areas which i have listed for for the uh, for for this session but there are so many areas in which uh, other gender identities are also constructed moving on to queer studies uh, we can see that in 16th century uh, there is a turn in gender ideology which has happened and which uh, through which there is a there is a movement towards establishing the rights and identities of this other uh, so it critiques the traditional notions of gender and sex so with this new ideologies with this new beliefs with this new thoughts uh, there is a criticism which has stepped in from our traditional notions of gender and sex it challenges questions of heterosexuality so the first uh, question that has come up with queer studies is it challenged the notions of heterosexuality and there is an element of homosexuality and other sexualities also which has come up in the purview of queer studies it has stirred moments for gender and sexuality rights which are evidently seen from the uh, plethora of works which have come up in uh, literature also in the context of queer studies it has stirred uh, moments different moments have uh, happened over continents which have uh, established gender and sexuality rights also even though there are countries uh, in which still uh, certain kind of gender or sexual rights are not given but still movements have been stirred and there is an anti gender movement uh, which which also has come up which has also popped up in con uh, in different countries we can see that it it is seen in russia we can see its uh, relevance in hungary we, we can see it in china we can see it in romania these anti gender movements have also come up uh and uh, there is a queer theory which has emerged in the 1990s out of queer studies and women studies so generally uh, when we talk about literature and gender studies queer theories are something which we discuss in the present uh, there are so many prominent writers and critics who have worked on these theories including lauren berlant and uh, judith butler adrian rich diana fas lee edelman and sedwick uh, teresa anna mary dilan kosla gayatri reddy mm, from india max wolf valerio the living smile vidya from india lakshmi narayan tripathi from india and ai revathi from india so we have lot of people we have collaborations we have studies we have prominent critics and writers across continents who have tried to voice the issues of gender equality and the need for gender rights but then literature again has a lot of scope for understanding these gender identities and also for studying these gendered constructions so now we will examine some central concerns that we have the major concerns that we have in this context uh, includes uh, these uh, identities the gay the lesbian the cross dressing the hermaphroditism the gender ambiguity and gender corrective surgeries also these are also all these are all areas in which we need to have our concerns on and uh, we need to also focus on uh, these major queries that include what causes homosexuality what causes heterosexuality why is sexuality central in some people's perspective or in some cultures perspective uh, has to be focused on one of the interesting contribution in this domain in the context of queer studies and gen, uh, in the context of uh, lgbtq studies is uh, the mildred berryman's uh, work the psychological phenomena of the homosexual which is a very uh, breathtaking work which has a lot of uh, 
uh, which has uh, created a lot of uh, movements in the present. So this is one important work, uh, one important contribution in this uh, particular domain. And uh, now we examine the challenges involved in LGBTQ studies. Uh, <clears throat> the main challenge that we face not just in LGBTQ studies, but in all other sexualities is that sexuality itself is fluid in nature. So this is one major challenge. So even the uh, the other identities of the lesbians case. Sorry to interrupt you, Panikar uh, Ji, but um, you need to wrap up because there are so many questions. There are so many questions. And they are requesting me to ask um, all the questions and already it is almost taken up uh, one hour. So please conclude the, your talk so that I can at least ask you two, three questions. Okay, okay. So uh, shall I uh, wrap up with the last uh, comments? Yes, yes. Yeah. So sexuality has uh, personal connotations and there is a need for more literary depiction in the present. So now we will just examine the research gaps in literature and gender studies. Uh, one of the major gaps is that practices shape and limit gender construction. So this is one of the major gap that we can see in literary depictions. And there is a need, uh, there is a relevance of scientific findings in the present research. Uh, we have to connect uh, all these gendered identities to clinical knowledge, which is acquired through therapies and theories. We need to connect it with social psychology and sex roles. And also there is a need for connecting it with anthropology, history and sociology. So now let's examine the current challenges in gender studies and literature. Uh, I'm wrapping up uh, with these last statements. Uh, there is a compartmentalizing uh, which has happened as I have already touched on in the beginning till, the, till now. Compartmentalizing of gender identities have happened. So there is a need for working on removing these frameworks and understanding gender in more depth. So that is one area, that is one of the major challenge that we have. And there is a segregation of sexualities and forming formation of identities that are generally acceptable. So we have to go beyond these acceptable identities and we have to uh, and uh, these identity formations and we have to work against or work beyond these uh, these accepted norms or accepted identities. And it should point to the way gender identities differ among themselves and other gendered identities. So this is, uh, these are some of the current challenges that we have in literature. So with this, I'm wrapping up uh, with my session. I hope uh, it uh, was useful for you in understanding gender studies and literature to a larger perspective. Thank you, Dr. Gautam. Um, now, uh, wonderful presentation and uh, yes, I have also felt to see that, uh, that it's the seven o'clock is there and only the time is over that we are so so mesmerized with the talk and so many questions are there. I am taking two, two three questions because already the second speaker is there. And um, please try to answer those, those um, within as short as possible. For you, I'm telling you that uh, within the time is not there so much. So maybe you can you can post me the questions so that I can answer them uh, via mail if anybody is interested to yeah, you know. Uh, but let me ask you two three questions. That, uh, uh, yes. Can you please elaborate on something on anti-gender movements? Have such movements occur in India? Something about anti-gender movement? Anti-gender movements have happened uh, mostly in uh, um, mostly in US. U.S. has a lot of uh, movements which have uh, come up in the context of gender, especially in the context of queer studies. A lot of movements have come up. Uh, the uh, movements uh, for uh, queer rights have come up in the present. A lot of movements are there. Uh, which has uh, come in the present. Ma basically, U.S. is one of the major uh, area where a lot of movements have come up in the present. Okay. Uh, then the next question is, is there any method to overcome the binaries except cultural transformation? Or uh, can you have to that gender equality? Gender equality. Something to remain in the realm of uh, ideal only forever? I could not understand the question. Can you repeat it again? I could I could not get the question. Uh, Dr. Gautam, can you repeat the question again? Dr. Gautam, I could not understand the question. 
Could you please repeat it? Ha ha ha. Please please. I could not understand the question. Uh, I think you were talking about binaries, but then I could not understand yes. what was the question. I am telling that um, is there any method to overcome the binaries expert cultural transformation? It has to be a conscious effort uh, from the uh, from the perspective of a researcher to overcome the binary. We should not uh, limit ourselves uh, by segmenting or compartmentalizing this identity. We should see it as a individual say if we are uh, if we are studying masculine behavior in a particular literature we have to see it from the male perspective from that individual's perspective we should not associate it with a feminine perspective or a female's perspective or the other perspective and try to read it we have to see it from the male perspective itself so that's why i am telling that binaries has to be consciously avoided when we try to understand literature and uh, gender studies okay Uh, it is often said that males are sometimes victimized by false rape allegations or false domestic violence allegations, yes. where husband uh, and the in-laws are directly charged. How to prevent such incidents? What can a man do to stop such incidents? <laughs> That's the interesting question. Yeah. Uh, recently, if you observe the recent uh, national surveys on victimization of gender, you can see that. Uh, mostly uh, gender victimization especially in some parts of asia has happened mostly on men so um, victimization has happened and one reason why victimization has not been registered there are so many cases which are not registered especially in the context of domestic violence for that matter has not been registered mainly because of the gender construction so men themselves feel a little uh, element of shame or guilt to mention that they have been victimized so that is one reason why uh, mostly such cases does not come out in the purview but then there are so many cases in the present where victimization of men have also been voiced out and we can see that many of the surveys point to the fact that men suffer more than many women or many other gender identities in the present so definitely there is a scope for they have to voice out if they don't voice Uh, there is no scope for understanding victimization so there is a need for a desperate need is there for them to voice out the victimization yeah okay okay you have said that poor studies has emerged from gender and feminist studies but in the beginning the transgender or people with different orientations were not included in feminist movements or studies what is your take on it? uh in the feminism in the earliest stage wa was trying to establish the rights for women and the identity were were trying to construct an identity and a firm platform for women that is the reason why other identities were not given much emphasis in the earliest uh, stages when feminism or women studies was involved in evolving but now the trend has changed and it is having connections with other areas or other domains so uh, earliest days it was not there definitely because there was a need for establishing the the women's identity so that could be the reason why other uh, identities were not given much focus in the earlier days yeah okay um, can you please justify your listening of jane austen as a prominent feminist writer and at the same time um uh, sriya has also pointed out the fact that how is tagore uh, romanna tagore is missing from the list of male writers to study masculinity and feminism overall second half of the question i could not get you first uh, first part only can you repeat it again yes can you please justify your listing of jane austen as a uh, prominent feminist writer i i have listed jane austen as a writer why because jane austen's work has been studied in the context of feminism that's the reason why i have listed but it doesn't mean that uh, i'm not trying to uh, brand any writers as feminists no but i am telling that these are some of the co uh, prominent contributors whose works have been studied in the context of feminism okay now there is another question Mm. how does constructed masculinity affect men's mental health 
yeah that is an area worth studying you know mental health and masculinity is an area which has to be studied a lot of research is happening in this area um, i feel literature also should focus on uh, the construction of uh, the, the the male psyche if you see a character in a particular work you should see the psyche how it is constructed and maybe you can associate it with uh, medical works works which are uh, uh, in the field in the domains of uh, medicine and psychology and you can talk about mental health of uh, uh, certain you know characters which are depicted in literature which can have a sociological relevance so social relevance yeah okay. so there are still a lot of questions but due to time constraint i'm unable to ask you those but i will definitely share all the questions to you and yes, uh, oh, but i would uh, i would like to ask a question gota like yes, could i yes, go please. forward and ask ma'am uh, ma'am ha, i would like to know about your uh, about what you would uh, like to place first for gender studies should it be equality or should it be equity or both should go to, uh, together equity yes yes i would i would go for that for equity yeah yes ma'am uh, please uh, 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 share your observation please uh because uh, um, if you see in the context of uh, gender studies equality is something which has been uh, discussed or which has been uh, which has been uh, critiqued over long years so we have we have we have had we still have lot of voice uh, voicing of these problems but then there is a need to see all genders from a from the same canvas so that we can have better vision about these gendered identities so when we go for placing equality then there is a there is again a, a possibility for segmenting or categorizing genders so we we should not go with these categories but instead we should see them in par with each other that's why i will go for the second option yeah thank you thank you so much yes okay, okay. so um, i would like to Professor well, Harty, what a thanks to you for blessing today's evening in in this illustrious way and delivering today's inaugural lecture. Thank you for your very interesting and thought-provoking address, and I'm sure that all the participants have taken note of your suggestions, observations, ideas, and all the research gaps are there. And at the same time, we have also put a few areas on which. a tremendous research work can be done so i'm sure that they will be discussing within their organization action to be initiated at their level so uh, i am indebted to you and thanks a lot i would like to leave a thanks note to uh, bara bazar bikram uh, Col memorial college and uh, west bengal and also to dr gautam uh, for organizing this uh, international fdp and also to all the uh, the team the team behind uh, this fdp so thank you very much uh, for this opportunity it was indeed a pleasure to share my own opinions and also the opinions of other stalwarts in this area thank you thank welcome okay okay, okay. Shall I log off? Yes, you can. Thank you. So now we are heading to our to the second session, and pardon me that uh, we are so much enthralled in this kind of observation, in this kind of sharing that we have failed that there is a time limit also. So pardon me if we are running late. But how can we resist? ourselves from listening such a talk where so many other areas are explored in this vb2 now i am now i'm going to welcome professor nazmin sam mehtab who is the supernumerary professor from the department of women and gender studies university of dhaka bangladesh and wait and uh, let me tell you that um, she is one of the founding members involved in the establishment of the department of women studies in march 2000 she pursued a masters degree in politics with specialization in public administration from the london school of economics and political science at the university of london in 1975 she completed her phd from the university of delhi india in 1982 she was a senior fulbright scholar at george washington university Washington DC in 1989 and worked on women in administration 
our areas of specialization include women and and poverty gender and development violence against women edaw and women's right gender and governance women in public policy and leadership gender equality and empowerment of women we are really grateful to have you in this platform and ma'am now i am welcoming you and i am requesting you to start your talk. the stage is all yours uh, thank you very much and uh, uh, before i uh, start my formal presentation i want to speak a few words i you can take this from my time also i I feel proud and privileged to attend the 7th day international level online faculty development program on gender sensitization organized by the women's cell and department of english barabazar ekram tudu memorial college purulia west bengal india congratulations my and sincere thanks to the organizing committee dr chandra kanta pandey teacher and third and chief patron vptm college sri puva mahalan visa Convener and HD Department of English, BBTM College, Dr. Gautam Kormakar, the Convener and Organization Secretary, Department of English, BBTM College. I would like to acknowledge first my, Dr. Bushra Sultana from my department, my ex-student and colleague now, because she was the first one to give me the information about this program. And indeed, in this aspect, I would like to offer my sincere gratitude and thanks to Dr. Gautam. For inviting inviting me to this program and be in constant and continuous contact with me regarding my presentation, I would like to acknowledge the assistance I received from my student, my one of my students, Noshin Faria, in the third semester, and my youngest son, Nahi Matap, who senior lecturer at Independent University, to help me with all the minor computer details of getting connected to the link. It was a very difficult task for me, Dr. Gautam. So <laughs> now I start. Okay, okay. start my, my presentation is divided into two parts. It is the name is gender inequalities in Bangladesh, impact on impact of COVID-19 pandemic. So first, I uh, define gender inequality according to me. It has been given in my book. It refers to the disparities between women and men in society in terms of the visibility in social, economic, and political spheres and shares in decision-making at the levels of society. Although half of the world's population consists of women, they don't have the same benefit and growth as men. I give the certain statistics given by UN in the 90s, but still, this statistic is still valid today. Women, to show, indicate inequality. Women perform 67% of the world's working hours, Women earn 10% of the world's income. Women constitute two-thirds of the world's illiterate. And women less earn less than 1% of the world's poverty. Now, Gender Equality Index measures inequalities in three important aspects of human development. And Gender Inequality in 2017 sheds light on the position of women in 160 countries. First, reproductive health measured by maternal mortality ratio and adolescents' birth rates. Second, empowerment measured by proportion of parliamentary seats occupied by females and proportion of adult females and males aged 25 years and older with at least some secondary education. Third, the economic status expressed as labor market participation and measured by labor force participation, rate of female and male population aged 15 years and older. So you can see that the gender inequality in 2017 in South Asian countries with Bangladesh is out 134, uh, first is one, uh, Afghanistan and 153. Now, gender equality in Bangladesh, I, I don't want to go into details, but I want to say where we have the gender equality, women's economic status, women's engagement in economic activities. Women in the economy, women's unrecognized contributions in the national economy, the service go, goes unrecognized. Their headship and household, the emerging trend of female headship of household is increasing day by day. 
women in education, women in health, women in politics. These are the various areas. Now, the main concentration I go on the COVID-19 situation in Bangladesh. I'm, I'll talk about all these issues within this the COVID system. The Institute of Epidemiology, Disease Control and Research announced the first country's first confirmed COVID-19 cases after three people were tested positive for the infectious virus in the capital city of Dhaka on March 8, 2020. IEDCR reported the country's first coronavirus death on March 18. As of July 2020, COVID-19 has spread to almost all parts of Bangladesh. Now we are having, at present, a very serious condition regarding this COVID-19. It has spread in all parts of Bangladesh very actively. Because you see, the, the, the main problem here is, although the government has announced lockdown and social distance uh, measures, but due to the uh, unconsciousness of our people, the illiteracy of the people, and the, the, the poverty of the people, they do not understand, they did not understand what was actually the meaning of lockdown and social distance. This lockdown, they thought in the first that it is a, a, a type of natural holiday they observe during our Eid festivals. So they, when they, uh, the government announced the lockdown, you see, they went in branches to their hometowns as they do during Eid festivals and other festivals. So lockdown was not understood by people and also social distance measures. Now, in, and, but I want to focus on women and girls. Unequal impact of Bangladesh. In Bangladesh, COVID lockdown at this proportion. Gender inequalities are exacerbating gender-based disparities between women, men, girls, and boys in terms of access to information, resources to cope with the pandemic and its social economic impact. The, the, the two important aspects which I'm going to focus is on female education or harmful effects on female education and on violence against women. These two have tremendously increased the effects. And also health has been also affected much, women's health. Many girls might never return to schools. Since March 26, all educational institutions have been closed as part of the government's efforts to contain the spread of COVID-19. As of now, schools are not expected to reopen until September. But that may also continue. depends on the situation of the country. The lockdown may force students coming from daily wage earning family, families to drop out due to financial problems. Girls are likely to be the first to drop out. And this may lead to increase in early marriage and other negative and gendered coping mechanisms. One of the organization, international organization plan international research shows that in crisis setting, girls live in fear of violence and a concern about the constant presence of armed men and about gender-based violence within families. Where we, schools are closed, girls are generally given more household responsibilities as compared to boys due to the pre-existing gender equalities and gender norms. Girls from marginalized and poor communities and the highest risk group, they may discontinue the education and number of out-of-school children may increase. As the schools reopen, a lot of girls will find it difficult to balance school work and increase domestic responsibilities. Many of them might shift income generating activities to support their family, foregoing the education. The home quarantine during COVID-19 and the closure of schools, learning centers, child-friendly spaces, protective environments will have negative impacts on the educational attainments and increased exposure to child protection risks, such as sexual exploitation, child labor, neglect and physical and emotional abuse that could negatively affect child development, especially adolescent girls. Now we have also the detrimental impact on income generating activities, women access to livelihood and food security is at stake. The, the most important part is lives of women in RMG sector is getting worse. The RMG sector, 65% of employees are women, around 6 million, who are among the hardest hit by COVID-19. COVID One quarter of government workers in Bangladesh have been fired or followed because of declining global orders amid the coronavirus. You see, many of the uh, uh, cup buyers have uh, stopped down there. Uh, uh, 
uh, export from the uh, from Bangladesh due to the uh, uh, coronavirus. Most of the workers did not get their salary due to shutdown of industries. Many industries were shut down in the beginning, but later on, when they when the when the whole uh, when it was lockdown was announced, they don't understand. They came back because of fear of losing their job and also fear of losing their uh, their their salaries. The major income these workers earned was barely enough to cover their living costs, and as a result, they have little to no savings set aside to deal with the current crisis. Within these laid off female workers, there are single mothers, pregnant women lactating mothers and they will not get any support from the factory owners many of these face you abuse at home by their husband this proportion burden of houses and care of care work on women's shoulders due to this lockdown situation you see we have average number of work spent on unpaid domestic and care work in a week disaggregated by sex is bangladesh 24 hours for women and seven hours for men Lockdown and social distancing have resulted in an increased burden of unpaid care work and household courts. A survey conducted by the UN Women suggests that little to no shift in redistribution of domestic work was as a result of this confinement. School closures during the lockdown further exacerbated the burden of unpaid care work on women who absorb most of the additional work of caring for children. Although men are at home, and sharing some responsibilities like children's education or playing with children, 10% as opposed to women's 5%. Women's household codes have not necessarily decreased as per the survey conducted by UN women. In a country like Bangladesh, where healthcare facilities are poor, we have a very fragile healthcare facility, public health facilities. The unequal division of labor in household will be enhanced as COVID 19 stretches healthcare system resulting in care responsibilities falling into women and girls who usually bear responsibility for caring for ill family members and the elderly. As family members fall ill, women are likely to provide care for them. The unpaid care work, paid care work is more difficult for female-headed households. Single mothers are particularly sensitive to the burden of unpaid domestic work. In comparison to couples that are married or cohabitating, a significantly higher proportion of single mothers report that the most time-consuming activity is cleaning or cooking. The burden of unpaid childcare work is increasing much more substantially for mothers or female caretakers. Women with children are more likely than men to report increases in time allocated to playing, teaching, and taking physical care of their children. They are more, also more likely to multitask than men, as more women report minding their children while performing other activities, such as work for way, pay or profit. In households with elderly adults, women are more likely than men to report increases in the time spent on most unpaid domestic and care work activities. They are substantially likely to see increases in the time spent providing emotional care and administrative support for adults, as well as cooking, cleaning, and making repairs since the spread of COVID-19. Many mothers often complain of being unable to cope with their work and maintain proper work time. In addition, they have to listen to the demands of their husbands who are at home due to lockdown and also other members of the family staying with them. Another great problem faced by majority of women is that those who had part-time domestic help in the houses had to remain on their own, running all errands in the households as these people were not allowed to come and work in the houses. So they are, for those who have part-time workers in the houses, they are now without any domestic help. Consequently, they always felt overburdened with work. Doing office work from home and maintaining household code became very difficult for them, and this sometimes caused severe domestic violence in the homes. It is worth mentioning here that many partners tried to help their wives with household codes, but majority of them were not helpful. Now, in, in, it has impact on social and reproductive health. The maternal health facilities are under threat during this. Risk to women and girls also increase the health system, divert resources from sexual and reproductive health care to respond to the epidemic, and if supply lines begin to creak, creak under the strain of the pandemic. Reproduct sexual and reproductive health services and commodities are often overlooked in times of crisis. 
yet women continue to require primary planning, menstrual health supplies, and maternal health care system. You see, during this pandemic, when the expected mothers, the pregnant mothers went to the hospital for the delivery of the child, they refused admission into the hospitals because of this coronavirus patients. They were given more care to coronavirus patients. Bangladesh has already see, have seen health system post allocate staff and resources towards critical care services and away from other areas of care. On sexual and reproductive health, services and resources may be diverted to deal with outbreak, which can lead to outcomes such as increased maternal and newborn mortality, that's which is increased now, increased unmet need for contraception, and increased number of safe, unsafe abortions and sexually transmitted infections. It is particularly worrying time for women who are pregnant and in need of routine health services. Infection control measures must be taken to protect women in antenatal, neonatal, and maternal health units. One, which is essential to see that one of the serious issues regarding the inadequate improper health system during COVID pandemic was attending to the needs of pregnant women. There were hardly any facilities to attend to the problems of extra expected mothers and there has been a high rise in both maternal and natal mortality pregnant women associated with various problems like need for abortion miscarriage unwanted pregnancies postnatal problems etc these problems are extremely severe and require proper treatment in both prenatal and postnatal birth care the hospitals and other medical or private clinics both in urban and rural areas do not possess sufficient amenities to look into these problems or they are not getting any importance due to patients needing care from coronavirus, which are given priority attention. Not only expecting mothers, but the problems arise with other cases. The problem also becomes serious with young girls and the monthly menstruation problems. If this is not properly taken care of, they ultimately suffer from various kinds of reproductive ailments, which may remain throughout their lives. Now, in the, the important portion here, which has uh, received uh, great significance during this COVID-19 is the increased prevalence of violence against women. We all know that violence is a human rights violation and a universal issue, but the existing crisis of violence against women is likely to work, is worsened in the context of COVID-19. Emerging data states that uh, service, uh, that since the outbreak of COVID-19, reports violence against women and particularly domestic violence have increased it you know, see before the covid 19 we had domestic violence in our country but domestic violence was an unrecognized issue it was not it was not given any recognition domestic violence gender violence i want to quote professor eka pande who stated in a the in a conference gender violence occurs due to the unequal power relations between men and women and here if you say what is the uh, cause of um, domestic violence why, why is the increase in domestic violence now if i talk about uh, patriarchy everyone will go out of the room i don't want to talk about patriarchy patriarchy is the main reason Patriarchy is the main reason, I know, but I don't want to talk about patriarchy here. I just want to say, what is domestic violence? Starting with this, I want to start from a quote from WHO, the World Health Organization, in one of their multi-country studies in 2007 in Geneva. Studies on domestic violence against women stated that Domestic violence is, in, is widespread, deeply ingrained, and a serious impact on women's health and well-being. That we have violence. I don't want to talk about patriarchy. The globe, the, the, I was talking about WHO's uh, the data that it has a serious impact on women's health and well-being. Its continued existence is morally indefensible.
civil, its cost to individual, to health systems, and to society is enormous. Yet no other major problem of public health has been so widely ignored and so little understood. So global data shows pandemic disease outbreaks increase incidence of gender-based violence, particularly exposing girls and women to domestic violence, in intimate partner violence and rape. At the same time, life-saving care and support for gender-based violence survivors are disrupted when frontline service providers and systems such as health, physical and mental protection, legal and police and social welfare are overburdened and preoccupied with health in COVID-19 cases. Domestic violence is not no longer a private issue. It has become a public issue now. Day by day, it is increasing in our country. So you may ask, why is domestic violence increasing? There are many issues, social, economic, psychological, everything. Because in, in the, in, due to the uh, lockdown situation, our, uh, many of the uh, uh, husbands are staying at home. And so they abuse uh, their wives. And, but domestic violence is not only abusing wives. It, it has many layers. Wife, any other old people, young girls, any other strangers living with in the families, all people are under victims of domestic violence. The vulnerability and disadvantages in marginalized groups, transgender, female sex workers, women and adolescent girls and disabilities, women living with HIV, migrant women and homeless women are heightened under the current crisis. A need assessment working group assessment report reveals 49.2 percent of women and girls feel safety and security is an issue in the lockdown both the gender monitoring network consultation and qualitative and a BRAC study on COVID-19 in the slum support the assumption of increased domestic violence anticipatory multisexual needs assessment done in April 2, 2020 reveals that at least 33 percent of women and girls are unaware of where to seek help for abuse and on ill treatment by anyone, including family members. We see we have laws for domestic violence, Domestic Violence Protection and Prevention Act 2010. But women and girls, they fear to take any help from uh, the, this act. So the, the reason is they fear for social stigma and they fear for financial dependence. If the file, if if the if a girl is if, uh, is a victim of domestic violence, the parents will never file a case again uh, against this because it is it just becomes a social stigma for the family, and then the, the girl also may fear that if she asks for, they may suffer financial crisis because the cases take use a lot of money. Few media reports indicate fear of COVID-19 infection acting as a trigger of abuse, the target which are often women and girls. In the month of April, 19 cases of gender-based violence have been reported in the media, majority of which were rape and physical assault. Between March 26 and April 12, the National Emergency Help Plan received 769 calls related to violence against women, which is higher than usual. There were 101 rape incidents, 69 were rape, 69 were rape, 25 gang rape, and seven were murdered after rape, according to data collected from reports published in 14 national newspapers. Now, an important survey, tele survey was rapid this survey was conducted by Manushir Jono Foundation. It is a human rights organization. It start, stated that in, it uh, started the function from January to April, stated that nearly 4,000 4, uh, women have been victims of violence during January to April 2020. And among three women, on an average, one woman is prone to domestic violence. Another important point to mention here is that, as noted about Marshall Joe study, it has been found that during this pandemic, many women have experienced domestic violence for the first time in their lives. This amounted to 1,600 women. From March till May 2020, 40, 480 women and children have fallen victims to violence in Bangladesh, according to the data collected by the Bangladesh Mohila Parishad. 
Later, they revealed that there were 308 reports of torture and sexual violence against women in the month of June. That these times of social isolation increase the risk of domestic abuse and other forms of gender-based violence. Women in violent relationships are stuck at home and exposed to their abuser for longer periods of time. This makes it very difficult for them to call helplines as the perpetrator is always around. Lockdown and loss of livelihood inevitably works as a trigger of violence against women. Cases related to the cause of loss of jobs or the male giving rise to fr frustration. Increased amount of mental stress among men also cause trigger violence. Men are more likely to be employed as wage earners in the formal employment sector in the family, which means they will either continue to work and be at greater risk of exposure to the disease or find themselves suddenly unemployed due to economic impact. This, combined with restrictions on social participation, may have specific impacts on men's mental health, which could increase men's violence against women and children in the family. Many men sometimes get very aggressive and arrogant when their wives deny their choice for any sexual activities. This is usually an issue of marital rape, which is very common in all societies. But there's a difference in the sense that cases of marital rape are easily talked about and sometimes cases far in Western countries. But women of South Asia, in this is considered a very private effort, hardly discussed with any with anyone. But after, within this during this COVID-19 uh, period, you see, marital rape has been reported on, a, on and off. So this is it is not no longer a private issue. It was found that in some cases women were at fault. These usually happen because, as we could see, that the crisis caused many women, women, especially the working population in the professional areas, to look into how the affairs together with maintaining office work from home. It became very difficult in maintaining proper timing for everything. This factor irritated many, causing aggression and irritation in taking their work workload. And so they were hardly interested in any type of sexual activities by their husband. Such situations also result in marital rape. Doing office work from home and maintaining household calls became very difficult for them, and this sometimes caused severe domestic violence in the homes. Experience have demonstrated that where women are primarily responsible for procuring and cooking food for the family, increasing food insecurity as a result of the crisis may place them at heightened risk, for example, of intimate partner and other forms of domestic violence due to heightened tensions in the household. Due to closure of school, violence against girls might increase. They might also become victims of child marriage, especially in rural areas. While staying at home, girls might get violated by the relative and neighbors and people they knew. Evidence, emerging evidence suggests that the COVID-19 pandemic has the potential to increase the risk of sexual exploitation and violence as women and girls may be forced to exchange sexual services for essential goods. Thank you for attention and patience. And if you have any questions, I'm ready to answer. Thanks yes. a lot, ma'am, for this wonderful presentation. And you were so energetic and so vibrant. You were. It's really inspiring share. for. <laughs> it's really I want inspiring to share. and. <laughs> I want to share something with you in this yes, month, yes, yes. July 20th, in this month of July 22nd. Uh, okay. I see I, I completed 50 years of my teaching experience at Dhaka University. That's, that's wonderful, ma'am. Ma yeah. Congratulations, ma'am. Thank you. It's just so, wonderful. So, although, I, although I was presenting a very, uh, 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 very unpre unpresentable fact about domestic violence, we don't want it. We don't want violence against women any any time, but this, I wanted to share this news with you that I completed 50 years of my service at Dhaka. Congratulations, ma'am. Congratulations, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, at have the same questions. time, ma'am. <laughs> yes, ma'am. There are a few questions, ma'am. But yes. before that, ma'am, it's um, very much true with hair also, ma'am. Here in India also, ma'am, that the this this kind of lockdown experience has magnified the concerns of women, and they are facing so many problems. If, safety from financial security from mental health and they are all facing this kind of problem and in this in this condition 
the difference that uh, it's nothing else between uh, India and Bangladesh because yeah, who yes. We, yes, who we do they are more unpaid care and they are doing the domestic work and uh, and Indian women also spend up uh, about almost um, uh, three fifty minutes a um, uh, day in their household work. That's the um, statistics if, is telling and which is five. 75% more higher and the factors that uh, this kind of double shifting, uh, shifting work and the absence of assistance of the household and the increased need for cooking, cleaning, caring and hygiene is for the increasing yes. and keeping their skewed balance of domestic work every day. So we, we all are facing the same kind of problem, the same problem, problem, problem. Yeah. and it's like that you have just narrated our story. It's not like uh -huh. the story of Bangladesh women. It's like the story of the women of South Asia who are yes. doing a lot of household lot work, of work, but they are all facing this kind of problem. Now, I'm, let me ask you uh, two, three questions. Although but, so many yes, questions want, are there. I, and, want to, I want to add something yes, more. You see, we have many migrant workers working in the Middle East from yes. Bangladesh. Many migrant workers. They have many been migrants. sent back. Yeah, they have been sent back to Bangladesh, you see. So when they came back here now, they have no yes. jobs, no employment. So they are unemployed, no income, nothing. So this is another cause for the increase of uh, violence against women. And women who are earning as domestic help, they are not allowed to go come to our houses and work. So they, are, they have no income also. So the, all this taken together, you see, increases violence against women. Yes, and ma'am, at the same time, ma'am, at the same time, ma'am, this pandemic also to some extent it's uh, very much costly. Yes, yes, ma'am, uh, because ma'am, uh, this kind of lockdown, ma'am, uh, this kind of lockdown even make us a bit more socially excluded, and women are now socially excluded. We are now. Uh, not entering the household to our house also so so this is also facing a lot of problem for those working women who depend solely and the whole family depend on them so it's on a kind them, of yes. huge pressure on, on them and uh, the yes. male counterpart uh, that's the fact ma'am you have greatly presented that this time the face of that migrant laborers they are okay. now jobless and they are also putting pressure on their women to earn money so a kind of domestic violence is there and it is increasing day by day, In day, by day yes. and, before yes. we did not talk about domestic violence at all you see but now domestic violence have become a public issue everyone is talking of violence is there of course but everyone is talking about domestic violence so uh, that's why I said it has become very um, uh, important, uh, increasing day by day. That's what we're yes. talking about more about, and and also the the, the my, we have another great serious problem of the Rohingya refugees in yes. Chittagong. They are the yes, yes. problem for Bangladesh. You see, there the pandemic is increasing so fast because there there is no question of social distance in in those. Uh, reallocation camps no question of social distance so it is increasing very much together with that we have a climate effect also you see nowadays we are having floods in the in yes. some areas of bangladesh floods have increased and when when we have natural calamities who suffers the women in the house suffers more so they are they are suffering more now so pandemic is on one side and then, then the uh, natural ca ca catastrophe is on the other side so you're having great problems now. Yes, ma'am. There are a few questions, ma'am. That um, yeah, ma yes, you yes, said yes, in sure. the, you said in the presentation that women were at fault for marital rape, and in some cases because they were overburdened with work from home and domestic um, household works, and uh, they didn't want to indulge in sexual act. Also, do you really agree that being physically and mentally tired justifies some kind of marital rape? Yes. Yes. When, when a woman is, for example, when a woman, uh, for example, she is very tired, you see, she is yes. uh, overburdened, she is just not, and, and uh, the husband wants sexual relations with her, she may deny, she may uh, not be able to uh, agree with him. So then, 
the husband forces her, then that is marital rape. It, this happens everywhere, but we don't talk about it, you see, because it, in the subcontinent, we, do, we take it as a very, very private affair. But now no one talks about this as a private affair. All women are talking about that we are suffering from marital rape, you see, because they, they, they can't give more attention to their husbands due to overburdened work. And uh, men also mental agony is very uh, suffering for them. Uh, suffering, uh, if, like, see, many, the children, they have no schools now. For six months, the schools are closed. What happens to the mothers who have to look after the children? The, the children have forgotten their studies. They don't know how, what to study now. They don't sit for study. So what will happen when school reopens, you see? There is hardly any chance for school, school reopening in the near future. Yes, yes. There is another question that um, yeah. how survival sex could be handled during this pandemic? How? How survival what? sex could be handled during pandemic? Or how survival does constructed sex, sex uh, could be handled during pandemic? You see, there, there are, we have many laws in the country, and we, and there has been direction given to the law enforcing agencies to look after this. That if if a, if anyone faces violence, they should not be disturbed. But their work has not been give, given very definite analysis as what is the work that in for law enforcing agencies, what are they do? Uh, the the that there are very uh, deficiencies in the legal aspect of our country. You see, no one actually knows what their actual uh, work is to to for the survival of se se uh, sex work. Um, uh, why, despite the use of women as statistics, women are absent from recounting the story. Women are uh, their their works are not their works are not counted as yet. They're not taken into the GDP in the, in the country. Their work their work is unrecognized. Our work is still uh, domestic work. I mean, it is unrecognized. Women do a lot of domestic work. Which, which, when, when, we, when we keep a domestic help in the country, we pay her. But when we do ourselves, we are not paid. It is not counted for. They think it is a natural duty. When my domestic helps go out, leave, take leave from me, I have to do all the work myself. Starting yes. The men take this for granted that this is my work. I shall do the cooking at home. <laughs> so they, they take it for granted. This is our work. This is not and when I ask for my pay, but then we, what, you can give me the pay of what what we paid the uh, domestic help. Then yes. not, not, everything gets unheard. They don't hear of us. Uh, Our voices are not heard. Yes, Our that's the saddest, saddest. Yes, ma'am. No, ma ma'am. Apart yeah. from that, there is another observation that I want to mm -hmm. tell you that. Are only the women and girls only victimized during during this no. pandemic situation? Don't you think about no. that? The male are also being dominated yes, of course, to certain of extent. Course. Yes, women and girls are not only victimized. Men are also victimized. You see, in this but we do we, when we talk about gender, for example, yes. we mean both men and women, right? But when we talk yes. about gender, we mean we, we give attention to only to women. But men are victimized. But women are deemed. Women are, uh, you see, demeaning and undermining the silent affairs of the women. Women are always silent. It is time has come for them to, uh, 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 for their voices to be heard. If women's voices are not heard, no one gives attention to them. So before I uh, end, you see, I want to uh, suggest, I'll give a message to the silent sufferers, those who suffer from these uh, uh, different types of violence, different types of uh, uh, sexual violence, rape, anything, domestic violence. Uh, I want to give a message to the uh, silent sufferers of our nation. You should be proud that you are a girl or women. You should feel yourself, fuel, F-U-E-L, fuel yourself with self-esteem and self-confidence. Love yourself and be strong. You may encounter many defeats, but you must not be defeated. I want to 
each of you to know that your voice can change the world. When a woman's word is heard, she is certainly a strong woman. Last but not the least, I would urge upon all the girls and women, please believe in yourself, master your, master your courage, speak out, and be the heroine of your life and not the victim. A message for all the silent sufferers who don't speak out, you see. Yes. At the same time, don't you think that even third gender are also marginalized? That yes, we need course, to sure. dismantle no, all sure. sorts of binaries. Now uh, we need to think about the transgender community also. Yeah, we that, have to yes. think about LGBT community also. What is your yes. take on it? That they are also yeah, being no, suffered yeah. during this pandemic time. Definitely, definitely. We are we see during the pandemic, they had they had no ways of earning money. Their ways of earning money is different, you know that. I, I think you know that. Their, their, their ways of earning money is different. So during the pandemic, you see many organizations, NGOs, when came forward to, for, to give help, assist them in the help by donation. We donated yes. for them to to run their life. You see, and uh, if if we are to fight uh, this uh, uh, discrimination and inequalities and injustice against women, we must start from the home. For if a woman cannot be safe in her home. She cannot be expected to feel safe anywhere. So home is the starting point. Where first, we always heard that home is the safest place for our girls. But now we hear that home is a terror for girls. Anyone can do anything uh, in the uh, in the house, home. Then it goes to the societal community. Like this, it spreads. You see. Yes. Okay, ma'am. Uh, so, the UN uh, UN reported in uh, in this during this pandemic that the domestic violence has become a shadow pandemic in the world. Yes. It yes. is it is increasing not only in the South Asia but throughout the world. Domestic violence has also increased. It has the UN has termed it that that it is a shadow pandemic, the domestic violence. Okay, um, and ma'am. Uh, let us uh, end this session with a positive note that I also think that um, government must immediately increase um, their compensation and provide uh, women and other genders with benefits at par with that of uh, like the government employees and um, Anganwadi workers or the workers working in different parts can be asked yes. to inquire informally about instances of domestic stress and violence and also reach out to the community. And then I yes. also think that it is imperative that our policy makers should adopt a gender perspective to understanding and analyzing the efforts also of the coronavirus outbreak and the lockdown on the economy and livelihood and social structures. Yes. We are actually, we all need men. Yes. Actually, we need the gender sensitization for all yes. the policy makers. There should be gender sensitization program for all the policy makers, the law enforcing agencies. That because you see, we see we we have a this thing the the police of the the place where the victim goes for help. Then the enforcing law enforcing agency says we 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 don't know anything what to do. Like they, they give attention like this. So they should be sensitized sensitized about this process of gender sensitization should be given to young boys. The policy makers, their law enforcing agencies, many women are law enforcing agencies in the police. You see, they also are not aware of these facts. So they should be given, as you have termed, gender sensitization, this whole program. So they should be gender sensitized. I think yes. so. Yes. And uh, for, the, uh, for the participants, let me tell you that if you want to go through the works of Professor Mehtabji, then um, she has three published books on this area, women, gender, and gen gender sensitization. And the first book is on women in Bangladesh from inequality to empowerment, published in 2007. The second book is introduction to women and gender studies, selected text on issues and concepts. And the third book is Women, Gender, and Development, Contemporary Issues. So you all can go through the books, and, and it will help you immensely to formulate your, your opinions. And ma'am, ma uh, on that note, I want to thank you for your stimulating speech.
your thoughts ideas and observations were specially helpful to those who want to know all the nuances about gender sensitization about the condition of all all the gender irrespective of, of male female or transgender in, in this pandemic condition and after this post pandemic condition and many members who want to do work on this area your talk seems to provide them a much needed help thanks once again for a truly memorable evening we hope you can join us again thank you so much for the, giving me the opportunity to uh, share with you my thoughts and because i'm i'm now still i'm formally retired but i worked as supernumerary now i'm an honorary professor i'm still teaching i'm still in the yes. teaching profession i'm not sitting down i have from <laughs> sunday to thursday we have online classes from 9 to 4 in the afternoon i i told you that please say in the date for because i have i have classes yes. till 4 So online classes we are attending, and I uh, I serve in uh, in two in private universities also. Apart from Dhaka University, the public university, I teach in North South University, the first private university in Bangladesh, and another independent university, the private, where I teach both gender and also public administration. Both are side by side. I go because my basic background is public administration, but I did research for. Three long decades on women's, and then I established a department for women's studies with great struggle, of course. Okay, okay, ma'am. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for your deliberation. Thank you, Thank you very okay. much. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay. Now we are moving to the third and last section of our talk, and there we have with us Dr. Rubena Zakar and. Um, This is currently the professor and director of Institute of Social and Cultural Studies at University of the Punjab. She earned PhD in public health from Bielefeld University, Germany, with distinction, uh, and she did master in population sciences from Punjab University and, and bachelor of medicine and bachelor of surgery from Sindh Medical College, Karachi. She won various prestigious international rewards awards, including. Heinrich Ball Foundation Doctoral Fellowship, AOK Best Dissertation Award, and Wilhelmsen Lippen University Society Research Award. Her research interests include gender-based violence, women, health in developing countries, inequalities in healthcare utilization, health and human rights, reproductive and sexual health, and maternal and child health. Until now, she has published more than 65 research papers in international impact factor journals. She conducted More than uh, um, she, con she conducted several research projects funded by various international and national organizations, and she frequently appears on TV talk shows to create health awareness among masses. And today, she will talk about sexual and reproductive health uh, related rights in South Asia. And indeed, it's a great pleasure. To, um, I think um, she has lost the connection. Wait a minute for the technical glitches. Hello. Hello. The um, can you hear me? Hello. Uh, should I start? Hmm. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> yes, ma'am, you can start. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Please. Hello to everyone. Uh, I will talk about sexual and reproductive health rights in South Asia. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, the previous uh, colleague, she also talked about a little bit about uh, different uh, issues related to sexual and reproductive health, but I will talk in detail uh, because uh, when you talk about gender sensitization, it is very, very important that uh, everyone knows about uh, uh, the sexual and reproductive health issues as well as sexual and reproductive health rights. So um, when we say uh, reproductive health related issues, what do you mean? So there are a lot of issues when, when we talk about reproductive health related issues. First and very important is menarche. And uh, many of you, uh, of you know about menarche. Menarche is the first menstrual cycle uh, at the time of puberty. And uh, many of uh, uh, women and girls, young girls, they experience a lot of problems because uh, in South Asian societies, uh, sex is considered as taboo and uh, there is not uh, 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 health education is uh, available related to reproductive uh, uh, health related issues. So there are many issues related to menarche when uh, girls are uh, reach at puberty. So this is one of the issue and the other is fertility and uh, contraceptive uh, use. And uh, as you know, um, if there is uh, less use of contraceptive, then there are chances of uh, more unwanted pregnancies. And if there are unwanted pregnancies, then there are more chances of induced abortion. And if there are more induced abortion, then there are chances that uh, a woman, they can uh, experience uh, complications, especially in those countries where uh, abortion is illegal. And in such conditions, the abortion is performed in uh, a very unhygienic, uh, unhygienic condition. And uh, um, so there are a lot of chances of uh, uh, complications, uh, infections, and uh, most of the time uh, it leads to death of uh, women. So about 13% uh, of the deaths uh, which are occurring uh, related to maternal mortality, these are due to these uh, unhygienic abortions. And uh, you can say these uh, unsafe abortions. The other thing which is very, very important, this is maternal morbidity and maternal mortality. When I say maternal morbidity, this means that uh, 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 all kinds of uh, health complications or diseases which uh, women can experience during uh, nine months of uh, pregnancy or during childbirth or uh, during the postpartum time period, which is six months, uh, six weeks after the birth of child. And uh, maternal mortality, this is a very sad uh, dilemma of uh, South Asian societies because uh, many of the countries still experiencing a lot of uh, maternal mortalities every day. So I will talk in detail afterward. And uh, when we say uh, or when we talk about reproductive health related issues, sexually transmitted infections and HIV AIDS, these are the very um, uh, uh, problems which can lead to a lot of deaths. Uh, and uh, HIV AIDS, it's very, very uh, prevalent in African societies, though it is not uh, very common uh, in uh, South Asian society, but uh, still we have a lot of cases of uh, HIV AIDS. And the other thing which is very important, because when we say about reproductive health, it's not only uh, reproductive health of uh, uh, women, but also of men. So there are many issues related to reproductive health, uh, related to uh, reproductive health of uh, men, uh, as well as uh, adolescent sexual behavior. It is very, very important because adolescent sexual behavior, it is linked with sexually transmitted infections as well as uh, uh, prevalence of HIV infections in, in a society. And uh, reproductive health service delivery and healthcare programs, this is also very important because uh, if we want to reduce maternal mortality, then it is very, very important that we should have very um, quality healthcare system for um, which, is, which include antenatal care, uh, natal care and postnatal care for women. And then very, very um, important issue, which uh, uh, already discussed by Nazam Nisa, uh, it's the gender discriminatory practices, especially the cultural practices. And one of 
Two of the examples are child marriages and intimate partner violence. Um, and there are many other uh, uh, cultural practices, for example, female gen genital mutilation, which is uh, very common in uh, African and Egypt, uh, as well as in Egypt. So, um, so these are the, some of the reproductive health related issues, because you should know that when we are talking about reproductive health related issues, so what kind of issues we are talking about. Uh, <clears throat> so reproductive epidemiology. When I say reproductive uh, epidemiology, what does it mean? Reproductive epidemiology, it investigates the distribution and determinants of disease in human population. So nowadays we are experiencing uh, coronavirus or COVID related, related problems. So uh, when we say epidemiology of COVID, so we want to see that uh, uh, where the disease is more distributed in which region and what kind of factors these are influencing the disease pattern. So similar is the case with the reproductive epidemiology that um, what kind of different uh, reproductive health uh, related issues uh, population is experiencing and what are the factors which are leading to these uh, um, health, ill health problems in the society. So epidemiological skills can be used to better understand the cause of a medical condition and how it can be prevented or its prevalence in a population and the urgency with which it needs to be addressed. So the main purpose of uh, reproductive epidemiology is, uh, for example, if you see the data of uh, uh, maternal mortality ratio 50 years back, you will find a lot of maternal deaths in India, in Bangladesh, in Pakistan, in Nepal, but now these deaths are declined a lot. What is the reason? Because of this reproductive epidemiology, because these uh, uh, nations, they have seen that what are the factors which are contributing towards this uh, uh, high maternal mortality and how it can be reduced, how it can be prevented, because all these are prevented deaths. So that's why the reproductive epidemiology, it helps us to find out the problem, root cause of the disease and how we can prevent this disease in a society. So here, um, life course approach is very, very important. When I say life course epidemiology, what does it mean? This is a study of long term effect on later health or disease risk of physical or social exposure during gestation, childhood, adolescent, young adulthood and later adult life. Because some most of the time you have heard in uh, even in your community that, um, oh, you have a disease and it, this, this disease is just on most of the people time. People think that it is just because of the one year's exposure to some risk factors so that's why you experience this disease this is not the case because um what we are experiencing different kinds of disease if you are experienced after 40 years of your age it is not just only exposure to risk factors during the last two years or one year it is because of the risk factors you are experiencing since your childhood, even before the birth of your uh, child and during the whole childhood, during the adolescent time period, what kind of, for example, if you talk about, uh, um, there are a lot of cases of coronary heart disease. So coronary heart disease, what are the factors? If you see coronary heart disease within the perspective of life course approach, it means that if there is a familial problem, it means you will get the disease from during the gestation time period and during the childhood if you have uh, 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 if you are exposed to very uh, fatty food and you are not doing exercise and similar is the case during the adolescence and you are exposed to so many factors and uh, during the young adulthood so then the chances of getting the disease after 40 is very much high and similar is the case with other kind of chronic disease, for example, diabetes. And when I say life course epidemiology, so I will see the life course epidemiology within the perspective of reproductive health. How? Because women's health, it is very, very essential to the health of individual family and society over time. And when I say life course approach, life course approach, it suggests that a complex interplay of biological factors, because when we experience a disease, there is not a single factor. There are multiple factors which are contributing towards this disease. So there can be biological factors. Biological factor means that the factors, uh, the disease can be transmitted through the genes. 
or to the other generation so these are the biological factors and the other is because there are many cancers with are transmitted from one family to another because these are transmitted through the genes to one family to the other and then the behavioral factors what kind of behavioral factors for example the exercise uh, for example the smoking behavior uh, for example the diet and if you are taking healthy diet so all these are behavioral factors and then the psychological and social protective factors for example if you are living in a in an environment if you are working in an environment which are very protective which are not providing you any kind of stress or anxiety so it means you are uh, working in or you are living in uh, very protective very pr protective environment but if the environment is very stressing then then there are more likely chance of getting the disease so it means life course approach it suggests that there are many factors biological factors behavioral factors psychological factor and social protective and risk factors which can contribute to this disease so why life course approach to women's health because health of mother before she conceives it impacts the in utero environment she provides for her pregnancy because if mother is uh, undernourished or malnourished then there are chances that she will uh, give birth to low birth child so there will there are more likely chances of getting complication during pregnancy so that's why it is say that if a woman is healthy then she can uh, give birth to a healthy child but if she is experiencing a lot of problems like uh, malnutrition then there are less likely that she can give birth to a healthy child so it in turn it influences the health of her offspring into adulthood so because if you see within the perspective of life course approach gestational time period it affects the health of uh, uh, offspring when the, they will become adult they become after the 40 years of age then the chances of getting disease it will be higher the life course perspective it conceptualizes birth outcomes as the end product of not only the nine month of pregnancy but the entire life course of mother leading up to the pregnancy so uh, that's why life course approach is very very important and if you uh, know about the traditional perinatal care continuum because um, uh, earlier when we talk about uh, uh, life course uh, we are we were not uh, aware about the life course approach then we talk about women's health within this traditional perspective so what is the traditional perinatal care continuum the first stage is the preconception time period yeah so it it did not start from the gestational time period but it start just only before uh, at the time when woman is planning pregnancy which is considered as pre conception period and then comes the anti pregnancy period which is the 9 months of the time period uh, 9 month of pregnancy and then it comes the natal time period which is the birth of child and then the post time postpartum uh, time period and then uh, interconceptional period which is the time period between two births yeah so that traditional perinatal care continuum just only take care of the uh, health of mother just before the pregnancy but when we say when we talk about life course approach it starts from the birth from it include the childhood time period it include the preteen teen young adult women when they are less than 35 years and then afterwards then they, they are old so it includes the whole lifespan of a woman whole lifespan so uh, that's why life uh, course approach is very very important uh, even if you want to study any kind of disease but when we study uh, reproductive health related issues life course approach is very important and uh, this is the main thing which can reduce maternal mortality in south asian societies so um, I have used the uh, uh, word of reproductive health many times. So what does it mean? Reproductive health. This is a state of complete physical. It is just only not related to reproductive organs, but it is a state of complete physical, mental, social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity in all matters related to reproductive system and to its functions and processes. For example, um, if you think that you are um, physically and mentally, you are healthy, but uh, you are psychologically, you are not feeling good. And many of the mother, women, they don't want to, to take uh, pregnancy every year. And they, but 
most of the time they don't have say in such kind of decision making so they feel themselves psychologically uh, weak and th because they don't have uh, mm, their say in such kind of very important decision making which are related to their life so um, then you can't say that women they have good reproductive health yeah because when you talk about reproductive health it is a complete state of physical physically you should be healthy mentally you should be healthy socially and psychologically you should be healthy and it is related if you say there is more disease it it means that the person has a good health no because if he has a complete he or she has a complete state of physical mental and social well being then you can say that uh, he or she has a good reproductive health and this is related to reproductive system and its function and its processes and it is you can uh, clearly understand if you talk about family planning uh, or uh, contraceptive use um, because many of the women they cannot decide in many of the families um, sometimes husband and sometimes in laws mother in law uh, she takes such kind of decision so i will also share some of the uh, findings of my study because i have also worked on in this area um, and i think this is also same case in uh, indian society so sexual and reproductive health it involves issues extending beyond the reproductive years because most of the time when we talk about reproductive health or we think okay this is just only the time period when women they are in the reproductive age group and uh, what is reproductive age group that women when they are in 15 to 49 years age group then they are reproductively active then this is considered as reproductive time period but uh, when we talk about sexual reproductive health it doesn't mean that it is only uh, for this is the, this time period Period, this extend beyond this reproductive years, such as preventing cervical cancer. When you talk about uh, preventing cervical cancers or emphasizing the need for a life force support, then uh, sexual and reproductive health is very very um, important. It's not only related to the uh, reproductive lifespan, but it's more than that because most of the time cervical cancer it occurs after the 50 years of age and uh, so the all kind of cancers related to reproductive organs this should be also take care of in the sexual reproductive health related programs uh, it touches on sensitive issues for individuals for the couples for the communities such as sexuality gender discrimination and male and female power relation because uh, as i talked about uh, family planning program because it is related to male and female sexual relations and in their uh, relationship uh, within the household uh, because uh, if there are more um, child marriages then the relationship uh, is tilted at one side so chances of uh, uh, more pregnancies less use of contraceptives is here so sexual and reproductive health it is closely associated with socio cultural factors its gender roles and the respect and protection of human rights especially in regard to sexuality and personal relationship so um, when you talk about sexual and reproductive health of a country it is there are many factors you have to study you have to think about it the what are the socio cultural factors what are the socio cultural practices which are uh, controlling women which are protective towards women and what kind of gender roles uh, society has and what a kind of respect and protection uh, for their rights uh, society provide so sexual and reproductive health it includes diseases for example hiv aids and uh, um, it also include non diseases for example the normal physiological processes pregnancy and then the communicable diseases which is sexually transmitted infection because sexually transmitted infections are considered communicable diseases it can transmit from one person to another and there are non communicable diseases for example breast cancer or cervical cancer ovarian cancer so uh, when we talk about sexual and reproductive health it means it includes disease non disease communicable non communicable so in short i can say that uh, reproductive and sexual health is not only uh, not merely about reproduction because most of the time when we talk about re reproductive health we think oh it's related to reproduction but it's not it's more than that it must be viewed as three interconnected domain example the universal rights women empowerment 
and health services provision because if there are sexual and reproductive rights are uh, available to uh, women and women they are more empowered then there are chances that they can practice these rights in the society and uh, it's also related to health service provision because if health services are provided to women because uh, uh, still in uh, many countries including pakistan india uh, bangladesh nepal uh, all women they are not provided quality and accessible health care um, in many part of the, the these countries uh, it's because it's even in india it's not uh, uh, very uniform um, that all the states they have the same social indicators so these indicators are different the social indicators or the health indicators are different for each state for example kerala state they have they provide very good healthcare system so the health because of provision of good healthcare system they have uh, very good health indicators means less maternal mortality less infant mortality less children child under five child mortality but those states where they are not good provision of healthcare services or in those countries where there are not uh, quality healthcare services are provided then the chances of these social indicators are uh, poor indicators are more so there are more maternal mortality mortalities more in infant mortalities more child under five mortalities and uh, overall poor reproductive health of women <laughs> So when I say reproductive rights, what does it mean? So there are different rights which should be provided to each and every uh, person, either it is he uh, man or woman. So these rights should be provided. The first right is right to consent to marriage and equality in marriage. So if you think about uh, Indian society, do you think that the right to consent to marriage is there? or if right to consent to marriage is there then do you think that equality in marriage is there because uh, um, most of the time uh, in our societies the uh, marriages are arranged marriages and uh, sometimes it's very uh, common proverb that if uh, a girl says uh, it's nothing it means it's yes so but uh, most of the time it's not true so um Consent of to marriage is very, very important right for everyone, for, for men as well as for women. So it's not like that uh, consent to marriage is not, uh, this right is not provided to women, but men, they have been provided to, to this right. No, it's, it's uh, equal for both men and women. There are many men who are not provided uh, this right, but the problem is girls, young girls, they are experiencing a lot of problems because of uh, non-availability of this right. And uh, uh, when you talk about equality in marriage, because if there is equality in marriage, um, equality in marriage means that women, they have also the equal uh, uh, chances of decision making in their day to day relationship. For example, if they talk about uh, healthcare utilization, they have uh, decision making uh, where they have to contact in case of uh, uh, antenatal care or postnatal care or delivery care. But many of the unfortunately, many of the mothers, they don't have this right. They can't decide that where they have to contact because most of the time mother-in-laws, uh, they say that, OK, we have uh, give birth to uh, 10 children at home. Why can't you? So why you need an expensive uh, doctor or a hospital? So, um, so that's why uh, most of the time women or even the couple, they are not provided uh, uh, equality in marital relationship. So this is very, very important, right? Which has a lot of consequences for uh, women's health after all. Right to privacy. The right to privacy, this is also not, unfortunately, in South Asian societies, right to privacy is not available because the a majority of uh, population, they are living in small houses. Many of the people, they are living, like two or three families are living in a small houses. So they are not provided a private place and they are not provided uh, privacy when to decide for their families. Uh, uh, planning so they can't plan it because after one year of uh, marriage most of the time 
people start asking oh when you are deciding for a, a, a giving birth to your child or like this kind of different uh, questions uh, uh, girls has to be experience so the other thing is the right to control one's reproductive functions do you think this right is available yes you can say this is available uh, for those women who are well educated and even uh, if uh, sometime uh, women are well educated even they can decide and uh, so the right to control one's reproductive function when they have to decide uh, with the number of children how many children they want it is sometime it is controlled by the uh, power structure of uh, the household sometime by the in-laws sometime by the husband and sometimes women they have little say in such kind of decision making and similar is the case with the respect to spacing of children uh, for example if a woman she wants three years spacing or two years spacing she cannot decide about this until and unless husband is not with her and similar is the case if uh, in-laws are pressurizing her so then she cannot decide about spacing of children so although it has improved a lot but still many of the women in rural areas in urban slums they are experiencing uh, violation of such rights the right to legal or safe abortion this is also very very important because uh, in south asian countries uh, abortion is illegal and uh, because of uh, illegal nature of uh, abortion uh, most of the services which are provided in the, under the table these are unsafe uh, abortions because when we say unsafe abortion unsafe means that these services are provided by the healthcare providers who are not trained in it because for example maybe dai is uh, performing such uh, abortion or it is conducted by uh, either it can be conducted by doctor but it is not provided in a safe and hygienic environment because the clinic is in such place which is hidden by the others uh, so that's why the people they don't know what kind of activity is going on inside so in such con condition it is very difficult to provide uh, uh, hygienic and uh, uh, sanitized material at the uh, abortion clinic so because of this unsafe abortion there are a lot of maternal uh, deaths are occurring so the right to legal or safe abortion is not available the right to access quality reproductive health care as i talked earlier that uh, uh, quality reproductive health care services should be provided if we want to reduce maternal mortality if we want to reduce child mortality but um, majority of the population for example around 30% of the population even in india in pakistan in, in uh, other countries south asian countries they are not provided quality reproductive health care services though might be health care services are provided but these are not quality services so when i say the reproductive health care services it should be quality services so it should be free of cost services it should be universal services for everyone not for a uh, different section of society but for each and every person regardless of their uh, caste or their sect or um, their social economic status so uh, the right to education and access to information this is also very very important because uh, uh, still many of the girls they, they are though there are many children including boys and girls they are out of school in uh, south asian countries but uh, if you see the statistics there are more girls who are out of uh, school because it is very general assumption that uh, who, girls what they have to do after getting uh, so much education they have to take care of household uh, chores so it's not very important because they are not going for job so it's not very important that they should be provided uh, education even they are provided education they are not provided higher education then so it's still a problem so right to education and access to information this is also very important in reproductive right the right to pursue satisfying safe and pleasurable sexual activity a sexual life this is also very important right and the right to receive education about the contraception and sexually tra transmitted infection this is also one of the rights that the uh, the country uh, healthcare system should provide education 
about all kind of contraceptions which are available and how these should be uh, used how what are the side effects and in case of side effects what they have to do so all kind of information should be provided but uh, during uh, you have uh, seen that during covid 19 the use of according to one report the use of contraceptive is declined 10 percent globally and when you talk about south asian countries it has declined from 30 to 50 percent uh, uh, in different uh, parts of the countries. So um, it's very, very important that uh, all kind of information related to family planning, related to contraceptive methods, and sexually transmitted infection should be provided. The right of freedom from violence and ill treatment. This is also very important, right? Because uh, as uh, uh, Professor Saima talked about uh, intimate partner violence, it's increasing during the COVID time period. Domestic violence is increasing. So uh, the right of freedom from all kind of violence, it, either it is physical, sexual, psychological, and financial, economic, all kind of violence. So uh, the, this right should be provided to each and every citizen. The right of protection from gender-based practices uh, such as female genital mutilation as well as child marriage and other uh, ill uh, treatments which are provided in the society. So this is all about uh, sexual and reproductive health rights. And uh, the next term which I have used a lot is it's reproductive health care. So what does it mean? Reproductive health care is constellation of methods techniques and services that can contribute to reproductive health and well-being by preventing and solving the reproductive health problems. And it also includes sexual health, the purpose of which is enhancement of life and personal relations and not merely counseling and care. So it should include counseling because, you know, many of the family counselors are available in, in Indian society and as well in Pakistan. So, but it's not only uh, uh provided uh, counseling and care related to reproduction and sexually transmitted disease but it include all the domains of related to sexual and reproductive health then you can say that reproductive health care is provided in a society so what are the components of sexual and reproductive health care it's improvement of antenatal as I talked earlier, the antenatal is the time period during the nine months of uh, before the birth of child, the nine months time period. Perinatal, around pregnancy means time period around pregnancy, postpartum, and newborn care. So uh, when we talk about sexual and reproductive health care, it means that these services should be provided. The provision of high quality services for family planning, including infertility services, and uh, because you know the family planning services should be provided by the state free of cost because many of the family planning uh, program in each country there is a family planning program is going on and the main purpose is to impart knowledge about the different kinds of contraceptives to uh, tell people that how important these are and um, in case of in, uh, side effects, where they have to contact, so all kind of information it should be provided, and as well as to provide these contraceptive uh, methods or uh, uh, to the um, clients. This is also part of this family planning program. So, if family planning program of a um, country is strong, then the chances of uh, uh, unsafe uh, abortion is will be, be very minimal. So elimination of unsafe abortions, prevention and treatment of sexually transmitted infections, including HIV, reproductive tract infection, cervical cancer, and other gynecological morbidities. So uh, all kind of, uh, uh, there should be some uh, health awareness programs that how sexually transmitted infection can be prevented, how HIV AIDS can be prevented, and especially they have to think about the high risk group because uh, when we talk about STIs and HIV, then uh, we have to see if there are sexual workers are working in a country that how these are controlled and if they know about uh, such diseases if they what kind of prevention preventive strategies they are using and the promotion of healthy sexuality and good adolescent reproductive health 
uh, is also one of the components of sexual and reproductive health care and uh, elimination of all kind of ill uh, treatments, for example, intimate partner violence and child marriages. So what is the global burden of uh, sexually and reproductive health condition? Why it is important to talk about sexual and reproductive health? Why? Because worldwide an estimated 250 million years of reproductive productive life of a person are lost every year as a result of reproductive health problem. So uh, reproductive health uh, problems, these are very important to study because it can lead to a lot of productive years lost uh, in a country. So sexual and reproductive ill health account for one third of global burden of disease among women of reproductive age. Because if you talk about, uh, you know about the global uh, burden of disease. Burden of disease means we want to see that in a society, which disease is most commonly creating the total uh, burden of disease. Yeah, if there is 100% burden of disease, it means one third, 33% or 32% of uh, burden of disease is due to sexual and reproductive ill health problems. And this is with respect to when we talk about women of reproductive age, but if we talk about overall population, then one fifth of burden of disease uh, is due to reproductive and sexual uh, ill health related issues. Yeah, so it means this is very, very important to know about the sexual and reproductive health rights and its related health issues because it is responsible for 33% burden of disease for women and around one fifth of burden of disease for overall population. Unsafe sex is the second most important risk factors for disability and death in birds poorest communities. How? Because as I discussed earlier, that because of unsafe uh, unsafe uh, sexual practices, there are chances of getting sexually transmitted infection, there are chances of getting HIV AIDS, which are very deadly disease, and there are chances of getting frequent pregnancies, uh, which can lead to sometimes uh, unsafe abortion and to death, and sometimes complication during pregnancies and lead to child uh, maternal mortality. So it is the ninth most important in developed countries and around 210 million women have life threatening pregnancy complication uh, because most uh, why women they have complication most of the time when there are frequent pregnancies when there are uh, less space between pregnancies then there are chances of pregnancy complication is much 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 higher. So half a million women die from complication associated with pregnancy, childbirth, and postpartum period. So that's why we are talking about women's reproductive health because it is one of the main cause of maternal uh, women's uh, death. So it shows uh, burden of disease um, uh, estimated uh, from 90 to 2000 data, and uh, it shows that sexually transmitted infections it can uh, uh, lead to uh, around uh, in 1990 6.5 years of life lost but in 2001 it 5.4 and according to recent data it is around four uh, years of life lost because of uh, um, uh, this sexually transmitted infection and similar is the case with other kind of sexually trans uh, reproductive health related issues here you can see that uh, different health issues in different uh, region uh, because you can see in Africa, um, HIV AIDS, it's very, very uh, common. And uh, when you see uh, South Asian uh, countries, then uh, perinatal conditions means the conditions around uh, women, uh, childbirth, these are very important, which can, can lead to uh, uh, daily. This is disabled, uh, uh, disability adjusted life years lost because of perinatal conditions. So here you can see that there are many uh, different kinds of diseases which can create a burden of disease. Um, here you can see that sexual and reproductive health conditions 
these are the most significant one which can create a burden of disease for a woman uh, because uh, um, here you can see uh, uh, two colors a uh, one color it shows that causes of illness and deaths among women uh, which is gray color and uh, uh, the yellow one is related to both men and women so here you can see that sexual and reproductive health condition it counts around 33 percent of uh, um, disease burden for women of reproductive age but if you talk about both men and women it's uh, about uh, 18 percent and here you can see other conditions as well for example, the neuropsychiatric condition, it's also very common among women, uh, it's, uh, it's around uh, 25%. And other communicable diseases, which are uh, very common, it's around 20% of the disease burden among both men and women, these, these are because of communicable diseases. Uh, so there, I talked about many um, uh, different issues related to reproductive health, and here I will discuss in little de detail about the two uh, important issues. One is the child marriage; the other is a maternal mortality. So, child marriage. What is child marriage? Child marriage is the marriage before 18 years of age, and uh, it is very prevalent in South Asian countries. Uh, which disproportionately affect young girls in rural areas, low income and low education household. Um, although it is, uh, uh, when we say it, less than 18 years of marriage, so it's not in every uh, city or in every area, it's more most commonly pre uh, uh, prevalent in rural areas or in those areas which is low income uh, uh, so, uh, countries or uh, sorry low income areas and low educated households because the girls they are not uh, provided high education and they are just married before sometime before 14 years of age sometime before 18 years of age so man child marriage practices has shown to be associated with negative health outcomes of women because if women uh, they marry early it means their reproductive lifespan will be, will be very long and there are more chances of getting frequent uh, pregnancies which can affect their health so women who are married as children they have reported to suffer more violence from their husbands uh, because we have i have conducted a lot of research on child marriage and uh, intimate partner violence and uh, i found that the, many of the girls who were married at early age they were experiencing uh, uh, different kinds of violence and not only psychological violence and sexual violence, but physical violence was also very common. And these were not only from their husbands, but also from their in-laws. So uh, because when they married very uh, at young age, they are first thing they don't have uh, uh, education they have they don't uh, they are not from very uh, uh, rich families so they don't have a uh, uh, good background though which can protect them from such kind of violence so these women they experience different kinds of violence because of different reasons south asia has the highest rate of child marriage in the world and because if you talk about uh, uh, African countries and other uh, pro, uh, areas, the South Asia is the region where it's very, very uh, high, highly prevalent. Almost half of all women aged 20 to 24 years reported being married before the age of 18 years. And almost one in five girls are married before the age of 15. So because uh, one thing that marriage before 18 years it's uh, uh, very harmful but if this marriage is before 15 years is, is age then it is more more harmful for for women uh, bangladesh has the highest rate of child marriage in asia the fourth highest rate in the world and nepal has also one uh, of the highest rates of child marriage in asia for both boys and girls so because when we talk about uh, bangladesh they have uh, high rate of uh, child marriage but mostly for girls but when we talk about Nepal, they have uh, highest rate of child marriage for both girls and boys here you can see child marriage in south asian and sub-saharan africa uh, it's the highest prevalent area where child marriage is common in the world is niger here you can see about 70 
four uh, percent of the uh, women under 18 years of age they are married before 18 years so uh, it's a huge number and they have divided this two into uh, two uh, here you can see the dark blue and the light blue the light blue color shows the uh, marriages under 15 years of age and dark blue shows 15 to 18 years of age so um, in Niger, around 36% of the marriages, these are under 15 years age. And uh, the remaining 35% uh, are uh, under uh, 18, 15 to 18 years age. And here you can see the Bangladesh from the South Asian countries, which has highest rate of uh, child marriage. Uh, and then it comes India. India has also around uh 40 47 percent uh, of the girls under 18 years they are married uh, 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 as a child and uh, in pakistan it's about 24 percent girls they are married before 18. so here you can see in sri lanka um there are less number but uh, you can see that almost uh, many of uh, South Asian and Sub-Saharan African countries are included for such uh, child marriage practices. Here you can see the percentage of women aged 20 to 24 years old who were first married or in union before age 18. And it shows the observed and projected values because uh, uh, from 1990 to 2015, uh, the child marriage uh, prevalence it has declined because of many of the uh, pr protective strategies have been started in all countries. So the rate of child marriage it's it's declining, and uh, it also shows that if this rate continues, then there are chances that. Uh, um, uh, the level of uh, child marriage will be 2300 23 million girls will be married before uh, 18 years age 20, uh, in 2050 and um, if the practices good practices and preventive practices uh, will be observed then there are chances that the child marriage will be declined in south asia by 2050 to 4% and if the current practices will continue, then the chances of uh, getting it lower will be 11%. More protective strategies, which are nowadays going on in different countries, these are going on, then there are chances that it will decline. So it doesn't mean that uh, progress is not going on. They, in, in all countries, uh, different strategies, are, protective strategies have been used and uh, the number is declining, but still, when we talk about the numbers or the percentage, it's very, very high at the moment. So child marriage itself is a manifestation of violence against women and violation of human rights. Because why child marriage occur? Because if there are uh, discriminatory cultural practices, then uh, there are more likely chance that the girls will be married before 18 years age. So child marriage itself is one of the manifestation of violence against women and children. So family affairs, particularly issues with in-laws, poor house management, because girls are younger, so they don't have much training um, and uh, they can uh, they don't know how to um, get the signals or how to read uh, in-laws, uh, different impressions or uh, ex expressions. So that's why they are experiencing more violence, because from one of my study, uh, I found that family affairs particularly issues with in-laws because uh, they have not had a good relationship with in-laws if they are not following all the orders of mother-in-law or father-in-law and uh, they are not very well trained uh, to, to take care of household matters so they have poor household management and uh, lack of proper care of children they also experience such kind of issues because they themselves are very young and uh, sometimes bringing insufficient dowry and uh, financial problems uh, or an act against the will of husband so all these are the different uh, factors which lead to uh, uh, physical violence or uh, psychological violence experience for these girls 
and sometimes these girls they are unable to give birth to a male child this is also one of the reason and uh, if they are not giving birth to a male child then they are experiencing very frequent uh, less space pregnancies which are as well very harmful for their health so these are the different reasons which were narrated by the participants uh, from one of my study uh, so low socioeconomic status coupled with prevailing patriarchal norms push these women to not only bear intimate partner violence but also force them to stay in abusive marital relationship because the girls who are married at uh, young age they are more likely they live in uh, abusive relationship because uh, many of the families they are not very supportive and they don't have uh, such kind of uh, uh, facilities available or services available which can provide them protection Uh, so when we talk about reducing child marriage so, so reducing child marriage it is linked with advancing education because if we provide good education free quality education for girls uh, then they are more likely that the girls will not marry before uh, in 18 years of age so if they are involved in education they are good in education services are provided good because in many of the uh, in, in many of the areas uh, good schools are not available and they have to commute a very long distance to go to these schools they are experiencing a lot of harassment related issues so because of different problems uh, many of the times they are uh, uh, drop out from the school so if all these issues can be taken care then uh, there are more likely chance that the girls will be in in schools um so it is also related to reducing child marriage it is related to combating poverty because if girls are women are educated they are in the contributing in the economy of their household of their country then there are chances that they can combat poverty improving health indicators because if they are married at the late age uh, or in uh, after 20 years of age then they are most likely the chance that they will be educated uh, or because it's a good age if they are married after 24 or 25 years of age they complete their education and then there are chances that they have say in the family matters and then they can Uh, decide about family planning and they they know about the family relations and there are more likely chance to reduce intimate partner violence in such relations so there is a need to raise community awareness related to negative health consequences of early marriage on women's health to increase investment on girls education and actively involve men in violence prevention interventions because uh, in those countries where men is involved in violence prevention strategies uh, it's it's very useful and very successful these programs are because most of the, of the time uh, in countries where are uh, more uh, men are involved in the uh, in violence prevention strategies then uh, or interventions then the program is very very successful because men are the perpetrator and in such case if they are on board and they know about such consequences because uh, my research uh, my uh, phd research is was also related to uh, intimate partner violence and women's health reproductive and physical health because um, i'm basically a medical doctor and uh, when i studied uh, started work on this issue many of the time many people they ask me oh you are a doctor why you are working on uh, part intimate partner violence or violence against women it's not a health issue so the main purpose of my research was to pro- project this uh, uh, violence against women as a health related issue as a public health issue because then it is easier for us to convince people that look it is not only a social issue but it is related to health of your family it is related to health of your children it is related to your health of uh, uh, your woman so then it is more easier to convince them to get rid of such practices so th- that's why it is very important to uh, make uh, to get on board all healthcare providers men and also civil society as well as religious leaders 
to reduce such kind of practices from the society. Um, in many of the countries where it is uh, successful, and these countries are successful on uh, in reducing the uh, number of uh, child marriages, uh, these are, for example, in Nepal and Afghanistan, they created a positive legal and policy environment. So if there is a law that uh, nobody can, uh, they, there are specific age groups for both uh, girls and boys, example in some areas there is the girls cannot be married before 16 years of age and uh, boys cannot be married before 18 years of age but i think it should be equal for both men and women it's 18 years age and uh, if it is there is legal provision is available then it is easier uh, and there is good implementation of these laws then it is easier to reduce these uh, such practices and uh, in Bangladesh and uh, in Bihar, uh, they have very good strategy of mobilizing communities for change. Because in India, human chain of 1400 kilometer long, it was uh, uh, developed and uh, it composed of hundreds of thousands of people across Bihar in January 2018. And now, up till now, many of the other states are also uh, contributing in it and they are taking part in it. So mobilizing community for change is also very, very important. And it was very successful in Bihar because in Bihar, there were a, a huge number of uh, child marriage cases were there. So that's why they have started this uh, uh, preventive strategy of mobilizing communities. So, and in similar is the case in uh, Bangladesh. In Bangladesh, they have started um, multimedia campaigns using the print and electronic media, social media, to uh, aware uh, people about the consequences of child marriages. And it was also very successful. Even their religious leaders, they have actively contributed to reduce such practices. And uh, then providing services to end child marriage is very, very important. For example, if good services are provided, um, good education services are provided, uh, facilities are provided, then it is more likely that this practice of child marriage can be ended. The second issue which I would like to talk about maternal mortality. Maternal deaths today. Hello. That um, so many questions are there, so I'm requesting you to, con to conclude the sessions because I will also take four or five questions. So, if possible, please conclude the sessions within five minutes. Okay. Um, so, I just because I have included uh, maternal mortality in uh, yes, and yes. So just a uh, little bit about the maternal mortality. So, maternal deaths, uh, why maternal mortality? Because it's preventable deaths. It's not these deaths which cannot be prevented. These are preventable deaths. And uh, about 295,000 deaths in 2017 uh, in, from these countries. And about 94% deaths are uh, from low-income countries. And which countries are, which regions are contributing most? These are the Sub-Saharan Africa and Southern Asia which account for approximately 86% of estimated global maternal deaths. And Sub-Saharan Africa alone accounted for roughly two thirds of maternal deaths, while South Asian countries are around 58,000 deaths. So um, young adolescents face a high risk of complication. And uh, as I talked about child marriage, because the uh, uh, young mothers, they are at the high risk of maternal complications. So uh, how we can reduce maternal, uh, that skill care before, during, after childbirth can save lives of women and newborn. Here you can see um, maternal mortality uh, trend in South Asia from 90 to 2013. It has, and it's very uh, good news that uh, the trend is decreasing in all uh, countries. For example, if you see in Afghanistan, it's also in decreasing, and uh, in India, it also in Pakistan, everywhere it is decreasing. But uh, in some countries, the pace of uh, this reduction is very fast, but in some countries, it's not. Here you can see 
uh, proportion of reduction in maternal mortality ratio. Um, uh, blue line, it shows the proportion uh, which the countries they have achieved. And uh, uh, if you have heard about Millennium Development Goals, because the Millennium Development Goals, they have all countries they have to achieve by uh, 2015. And uh, this is uh, the figure it shows that how these South Asian countries they have achieved maternal mortality targets uh, of uh, MDGs. So here you can see the Bhutan and Nepal and um this uh, uh, bangladesh these are the countries which have uh, here you can see the bhutan even the target was uh, they have achieved more than the target yeah and uh, maldives this is the country they have achieved more than the target and nepal so bhutan maldives and nepal these are the countries who have uh, achieved the targets and uh, india the target is here and uh, here you can see the target is here and uh, but it is near to uh, target and uh, pakistan is also just a little far away from the target and uh, this uh, afghanistan is also uh, near to the target so some countries are near to the target and some countries have achieved more than the targets so this i can skip and the intervention different intervention thank you very much so now you can ask questions. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for your presentation. That's a wonderful presentation indeed. And yes, now let me ask you a few questions. That um, uh, first of all, mm -hmm. is male sexual and repro and reproductive health not very mm -hmm. much researched but do you think yeah because there is reason because uh, a woman uh, sexual and reproductive health is related to reproduction and uh, um, women they are experiencing a lot of uh, uh, morbidities and mortalities so that's why this is well researched area in uh, all of the countries but uh, uh, men sexual health it, we can't say that it is not uh, uh, this uh, in this area there is lack of research research is available because if you see research related to infertility um, then uh, uh, and uh, other issues then hegemonic masculinity issues these are well researched in even in pakistan one of my students he has worked on it as well but uh, you are true that it's uh, um, it's not as much research as we have researched in the area of female uh, reproductive health, because there is reason. Because male, they are not experiencing a lot of morbidities and mortalities because of their sexual and reproductive health related issues. One thing which is uh, common leading to morbidities uh, is related to sexually transmitted infections. And uh, there are some congenital anomalies which are very common and the issues related to infertility. These are common. And then afterward in the later age, uh, survive, uh, this prostate cancer is common. So these are the different issues which are studied. But even if you see in the uh, domain of medical sciences, it's uh, the reproductive health uh, of male is not studied in, uh, in the reproductive health domain, but in the nephrology and in other uh, domain. So it's, uh, uh, this is uh, the main reason is just because women uh, reproductive health is linked with uh, reproduction and a lot of morbidities and mortalities. Okay. Then there is another question. Yeah. That you have mentioned the importance of consent in marriage and sexual privacy. In this context, yeah. how? Do we see the choice of a woman not to reproduce? The image of the mother is an ever exalted one, and women who cannot or don't want to reproduce often bear the burden. So, what will be your take on it? Uh, when we say uh, consent for reproduction, it doesn't uh, mean that uh, they are not just only, uh, yeah, may, maybe there are some women who, uh, who uh, don't want to go for reproduction, yeah, uh, but not many women. It's very, very few number who uh, not at all go for reproduction, but there are huge number who go for reproduction. But what we are talking here that women should have say, they should have decision making power 
for deciding when they want to have this next uh, pregnancy because most of the time what kind of problems we are experiencing in south asian societies that there are multiple pregnancies there are less space pregnancies and it shows that women they don't have decision making power because it is less likely that women uh, a woman she wants pregnancy every year it's not the case but uh, because of the reason because of cultural pressure because of uh, um, uh, non uh, decision making in the family matters they cannot decide that if when they have to reproduce uh, go for reproduction for example two years three years they cannot decide for that so but those women who not at all go for this this is also their choice but uh, they have to face the problem related to uh, their uh, relationship related issues from the cultural uh, pressures they have to experience it but this is also their choice they should be provided this right okay so there is another question that um, there is too much lost concern about migrant or pretty uh, women and at the no, end sorry? of the research program, there is too sorry? much less concern among migrant or refugee women migrant or refugee women refugee women refugee okay okay yes. at yeah. the time of the research someone is telling that uh, the third research on rohingyas they found mm -hmm. that girls have become mother in a very early age due to certain issue of their having proper education gender poverty and they were not sure about their homeland and hostland never allowed mm. them for getting education and fill this gap so please mm. highlight in this context while uh, relating with dalit women uh, within this community and also uh, what will be your take when they are unemployed they are the sex workers so what is your opinion about it yeah first thing why these women they are married early because uh, the uh, displaced women or the migrant women in the in, in the families where there are young girls they when they displace from one uh, a place to another or they migrate from one place to another uh, especially uh, within the context of this rohingya women they uh, these girls are young and then when they um, settled in another community then they are less likely because the uh, safe uh, uh, protective environment is not provided to them and there are more chances of uh, harassment related issues more chances of uh, rape related issues so that's why most of the time because we have conducted one research in uh, areas where the uh, internally displaced population they displace from one area to another and uh, for example after the earthquake and after this uh, kind of natural disasters then people trans transfer from one place to another because of everything has destroyed so uh, then they marry their girls at very early age and uh, we found that the one of the main reason was that they think that the girls are not safe at home and uh, because the safe environment is not there so uh, to, to just uh, uh, get rid of uh, girls responsibility they marry them at very early age yeah and it has a lot of consequences because these women especially because they already are experienced lot of problems related to uh, migration related issues because they don't have their social contacts they don't have they are not provided uh, services which are provided to the other citizens they are not provided good educational uh, uh, facilities or schools even not only you cannot even talk about good educational even not they are not provided educational facilities where they can the, the people they can send their children and especially to the girls to those areas and they can get the education so or uh, they can afterward they can good uh, find good job even if if they are getting good education afterward because of such kind of issues related to migration related to the area from where they are coming they are experiencing lot of problems to getting to get jobs yeah so that's why um, people they have the uh, this kind of uh, conception that uh, uh, either even if girls are educated they are not getting good jobs so what is the need of such kind of education which are cannot be successful in getting a uh, good job so then that, that's why they decide for uh, early marriages and definitely it has a lot of consequences um, not only reproductive health related consequences but also for the economy of the country Okay. Now I am taking two more questions. Yeah. What are the factors that have appeared as constraints toward health security of women in the South Asian countries like India and Pakistan? 
Hmm. One of the main thing is uh, status of women in a society. If you see, still, though, uh, uh, although a lot of work has been done, a lot of uh, protective strategies has been adopted and uh, is going on in Pakistan. A lot of gender mainstreaming strategies are going on in India. There are a lot of gender uh, mainstreaming strategies in every field, in health, in education, uh, economy, everywhere we are doing the um, gender mainstreaming. But still, still, our women, they are not able to get uh, uh, social status which should be provided to them. These are um, in India, although uh, in some states uh, things are going to be improved, but still, if you talk about uh, Uttar Pradesh and uh, the other states, uh, women they are more poorer as compared to men, they have less education, they have less economic opportunities. And uh, one thing which is very common that they are experiencing a lot of problems related to harassment at workplace, uh, in the street, and uh, everywhere they are experiencing problems. So, uh, and the next, the one important other thing is that gender roles. Because if woman is very well educated, if uh, she is uh, very good in um, uh, getting a very good job, but even though she has to take care of all kind of household activities, yeah, she is working uh, outside, but at the same time, she has to take care of all kind of household activities. And this is changing in European uh, and American countries in societies, but it's not changed in Pakistan. You have seen many women very well educated, very uh, having very good executive jobs, but they have to take care of all kind of household activities. And even I have seen uh, one um, video that one of the very high influential uh, women from India, she was, I think, in parliament and uh, she uh, came to home and uh, uh, taking care of all household related matters, even cook the food for family and then go back. So it means that such kind of different factors, these are hindrance for women's uh, equality related issues because when we say equality it doesn't mean that men and women should be equal but the opportunities should be provided equally but because still under the table we are experiencing problems related to uh, low paid jobs for women and high paid jobs for men and high influential and executive positions for men and uh, women even though they have the same educational background they are not uh, successful in getting such kind of jobs so it is there. So because of all these reasons, the women still experiencing this. Okay, okay. Um, I can take two, three questions, but I'm requesting you to answer uh, maybe a short way so that I can take also because so many questions are there and they are keep requesting me that please mm, ask the question, please take this question. So I'm also taking this question. That okay. why should reproductive rights include the matter of marriage? And is it not indirectly we are forbidding the single motherhood concept? Can you repeat it again? Yes. Uh, why should reproductive rights include mm -hmm. the matter of marriage? And is it not indirectly we are forbidding the single motherhood concept? Yeah. Um, when we talk about reproductive rights, yeah. So, uh, it means the right of both men and women, right of couple, because reproduction is there when there is couple. So these are the rights, uh, because it is the right of every woman to uh, uh, come in the relationship. Yeah. So uh, it doesn't mean that we are not talking about uh, single mother issue, because there are a lot of problems women are experiencing if they are single mothers, um, because uh, it doesn't mean that they don't have uh, reproductive health, health related issues, but the problem is when we talk about reproductive health and uh, rights, it's related to this relationship. But at the same time, it also because, as I said, that reproductive and he sexual health, it includes not only uh, uh, reproduction related issues, but also the issues related to communicable, non communicable diseases and the diseases uh, related to, uh, for example, cancer and uh, all other kind of uh, issues. So that these services to, should be provided uh, regardless of the marital status. Yeah, if it, she is mother 
or no, or not mother if she is married or not married it means services should be provided to each and every woman each and every person yeah the rights are for every person but some rights are related here for example i talk about right of education right to education and information it's for everyone for regardless of marital status it's for everyone uh, protection from uh, ill health uh, ill treatments from uh, violence violence at workplace violence in the street violence at home so all these are for everyone regardless married or not married but there are some rights which are related to the relationship yeah so these rights uh, sexual and reproductive health rights are not only for those who are married or unmarried but for everyone okay thanks sir yeah so I'm taking one last question that in south asia women are not given reproductive rights the condition is forced in india and pakistan what do you think is the solution women literacy or government policy what will be your solution and at the same time I think uh, everything comes to because education ki baat karenge to education is very very important because uh, until, unless women are not because at the moment uh, uh, still uh, although the ray, uh, literacy women literacy has improved a lot but still uh, there is a gap between men and women education or especially when you talk about uh, higher education there is gap yeah so until unless we are able to fill this gap women and men they have equally in education they have equal opportunity for economic uh, uh, economics and uh, they have equal uh, of, and women friendly environment is there until unless we have not such kind of uh, preventive strategies at the workplace is available women will not able to work uh, because uh, in at the moment around 25% of women they are in the uh, economic uh, activities in pakistan and uh, i think in india it's about uh, 35% women they are in economic activities so um, still there is a huge gap yeah so we have to fill this gap if you have studied this gender gap index report it shows that there the uh, gap should be filled in education in income in uh, uh, economic opportunities and uh, in this uh, um, political participation yeah so if gap should be filled in all these four areas then it means that there will be gender uh, equality gender uh, mainstreaming in all field and uh, for this two main things which you have already talked the education of women if more women they are educated all the social indicators will be improved all indicators but if you talk about child marriage it will improve uh, if you talk about uh, maternal mortality infant mortality uh, um, if you talk about overall development indicator of a country all things will improved if women are educated and well educated and the other thing if women uh, if uh, government is uh, uh, very um, uh, supportive and uh, they know uh, they are very uh, towards uh, implementing all kind of gender uh, mainstreaming strategies in all sectors then it is very easy to achieve uh, 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 women participation in all fields thanks a lot so i am not going to take up any more questions because so many questions are there and it will take a lot of time so thank you sir. extremely enriching talk it was and must have to say that uh, i would like to personally thank you for your wonderful presentation and judging from the comments of those who attended it seems that the second day is also seems to be very successful and most of the credit goes to you and the others who gave such interesting presentation Hope thank that you very much for providing this opportunity <laughs> we hope that you will want to be involved in our future initiatives and we are pleased to have your participation in this seven day international level online faculty development program on gender sensitization and i personally thank you for your valuable contributions and they are all asking for the ppt so you just please okay. share the ppt to me and i will, and send, I will send it to you yes yes, yes. thank you thank you just after thanks, the thanks, Thank you very much. Okay. Have a nice time and very good uh, whole okay. session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye.
so i am requesting now all the participants that the feedback link is already pro it is not the feedback link it is the assignment link that it is provided in the chat box you can copy it and then you can open it and then you can do the rest if any question needs a numeric answer like 1 2 3 4 please put that if it is a then it will be one if it is b then it will be two so if you do that and i am looking forward to your active participation from 6 pm tomorrow uh, in the same platform till then stay safe stay happy stay healthy thanks thanks sir so i am going to end the session and i have already shared i am still i am one more time i am repeating that i have shared the link and now again i am going to share it now for that several times i have shared the link now please do the needful with this link and thanks a lot for being there although the time is now um, 3 hours 23 24 minutes but i am I am indebtedly grateful and indebtedful to all of you that you are all there and and your participation gives me the motivation and the energy to do work in this way. Thanks, thanks. Good night. Stay safe.